Hey everybody, it's the Bennington Show. I'm Ron Bennington, Gail Bennington, on maternity leave. Today is Friday, October 26th, and man, what a show we have for you. First of all, uh, we're going to end the show with Vito's annual Hell Gigs, and I'm going to tell you the truth, Vito, it was an unbelievably fantastic job. It was an honor for me to do this show. It was an honor for you to be hosting Hell Thank Gigs. Thank you. For yeah. me to put something like that together that you host... He, he, you got confused. He, <laughs> you just said it was an honor for me to host it, and I had already just told you that. So you wanted to say something different. Yeah, I wanted to say yeah, something. Yeah, what did you want to say? It was an honor to work with you on Hell Gigs. Okay, good. There you go. <laughs> and Hell Gigs is on say at 4 p.m. And we got a ton of great names. Ari Shafir, Chris Stefano. Ellie Kemper, Elaine Boozler, Jim Florentine. It's 28 different comedians talking about their worst gigs. It's just amazing when a lot of people will say to you, oh, I couldn't do that. You know, the thought of that is just a nightmare to me. I don't know how comedians do it. And then you find out it's a nightmare to them, too. Nobody wants to sit <laughs> Or stand in front of a room and be rejected by them. <laughs> it just happens. I had a, I had a guy who uh, he was my PD uh, at one point, and as a matter of fact, he has a business now where he goes around, uh, flies anywhere in the country. He's a radio coach. You know what I mean? And he'll tell you like, hey, here's what you need to do, blah blah blah. So he said to me, he goes, um, I can be funny on the radio i just can't be funny in front of a crowd and i go well i'm gonna be honest on the radio you're the same thing as you are in front of the crowd you're not funny you just can't hear people not laughing because <laughs> i've fucking heard your act it's terrible <laughs> but radio you can get away with that you know all those zoo shows for years all those people with buzzers and shit and thought that they were doing great they weren't there's no blowback from the audience. Yeah, so. you just don't hear people fucking stare. You know, <laughs> imagine if you could hear every click of people going to fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many times do you think in my career people have just went, I'm turning this shit off? <laughs> it must have been millions. Look at mm -hmm. me now. All beat up and busted. <laughs> nowhere. Oh, no, I was supposed to go the other direction. <laughs> I'll tell you where I am right now. Coming up in just a few minutes, Roger Daltrey. Of the Who, Hall of Fame, one of the greatest rock and roll frontmen. I mean, if no matter what you're doing, it's a short list. Very. A very short list of greatest frontmen, and he's on it. Easily top five, too. Easily. Maybe maybe even top three. <sighs> Where else are you going? You go Mick, of course. I'll go Freddie first. Freddie. Over Mick. Freddie over Mick. Guess what? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie, by the way, doesn't even make my top 10. And unlike you people, I saw him. <laughs> and guess what I was yelling at the show? Already saw Bowie. Thank you. <laughs> fuck tooth motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it looked like a fucking snowplow. That's how big his fucking teeth were. You're going to put him over Mick Jagger? Let alone Roger Daltrey? Earl. I expect it more from you. Um, Chris, am I still going to Poughkeepsie, or is that off the table? Oh, no, you're still going to Poughkeepsie. That's happening Saturday, November 3rd at the Laugh It Up Comedy Club in Poughkeepsie. Go to laughitup.net for tickets to that oh, show. I'm going to be laughing it up, too. Hell, yeah. I am. When I tell everybody what Earl said. <laughs> yeah. He puts Freddie Mercury, just because Freddie is a fucking movie coming out, That's which I already heard. <laughs> Sucks, dick. <laughs> And doesn't actually suck enough dick. <laughs> like, they really they downplay yeah. that flamboyant uh, gay part of him where, I mean, he fucking stayed in the closet right up to the last second. And that was the 80s. Yeah, no, I don't think he ever came out. No, that's what I'm trying to say to you. I think at the end, like, the last day, he's like, yeah, I have AIDS. And then he died the next day. Don't. Why would you put my head here when Roger <laughs> Daltrey is about to do the show? Uh, are we going to bring him into who or something uh, in the solo? Solo. 
my favorite is, uh, and that's weird when he's got a Who album out. I mean, a Who book, but you're going to push the solo stuff. Say It Ain't So is uh, one of my favorite. It's like the perfect Roger Daltrey thing. And by the way, in this book, Pete just fucking beats him up constantly. It's you, and not physically beats him up. Fucking Daltrey in the, in the book, in, in real life, punches him in the face. Fucking, he goes down. And they thought he was dead for a second. That's how fucking hard he hit him. But Pete always was one of those guys. In an interviewer, he, he would bust the shit out of everybody else in the band. There's always a guy in the band. This is true. One guy can say anything, no matter how cruel. The other guy can't say shit. So John Lennon could say anything. He could like, Paul's a fucking piece of garbage. Paul's fucking... Half a fucking you know what. <laughs> um, and Paul would say, I wish John wasn't singing so loud and everyone was like, shut up. <laughs> You're an asshole. Stones, Keith can say anything the fuck he wants. He can say, oh, Mick has a little dick. Mick is, you know, uh, a fucking prancing peacock. And then Mick would be like, man, I hope Keith gets off heroin. And we're like, shut up, Mick. Shut the fuck fuck up i don't know why that happens but it's true and in this case pete could say anything and people roger could never really say anything about pete yeah the um he always got slammed for you know when the when the new who came out you know when moon died and they basically reconfigured the band they brought in kenny jones townsend was very diplomatic daltrey was I thought it was honest. <laughs> I think you're saying the exact opposite of what we're talking about here. But but Daltrey, saying, caught, but Daltrey always caught crap. Well, and he also, like, fucking, one time, Townsend said, we're three geniuses and a singer. You know what I mean? Like, for somehow, he's a fucking brilliant front man. Whipping the fucking mic. It's hard to fucking believe. And hitting high notes. Like, yeah. Oh, People are always rough on his voice, though. Always. Not me. Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, and then, this should be gigantic for you, Earl. The man that you were named after, Earl the Pearl Monroe, was going to be here. And in my uh, opinion, one of the real geniuses of basketball. Like, um, because where I grew up, people would always talk about Earl the Pearl Monroe, even long after he retired, because everybody in Philly was proud of him. But bef supposedly before he was there, there weren't moves. There wasn't like a fucking spin. There wasn't a, you know, bring it off the hip. People just played this very regimented kind of basketball. Um, and then he was one of the early guys who played that streak game. Which is what the game kind of resembles today. You no, know, the Walt Frazier would call it swish and addition. Okay, swish came, and addition. He came up with, and he described that for Earl Monroe. He was like, that was, he goes, you never saw anything like that before. And it was just, it revolutionized the game. Turned the game to something else. It became very, being more entertainment, but is also very skill oriented. Yeah, of course. I mean, it was fucking blowing past those guys. And he's just a god in New York because he won a championship here. It's like he, him and Walt Frazier. It was the last one, right? Yeah, the last yeah. one was 74. 73, 74. It's unbelievable when you think about it. That's why I think a guy like, uh, like there's rumors that uh, Durant might come here next year. It just makes sense for you to come to a place like this. Do you know how long we've been saying every the year it's a new thing? Every and year if he comes like here, here, he's going to lose here because he can't fucking do it. All right, at a certain point, you got to believe, though, Chris. I, Come on, man. <laughs> I believe. Okay? I believe. I believe. I believe. I what believe. people don't realize, because everyone's always like, this is a baseball town. Uh, well, it's a, it's a good sports town. It's a good hockey town. It's, it, yeah. it's primarily a basketball town. And when the Knicks do anything, the city fucking explodes in the way the Yankees, the Giants, the Rangers, and... None of the Ets teams have any understanding of. <laughs> but, like, look at Lynn's Lin sanity is proof alone that it's just all basketball here. Because that two week period, if you lived in New York, was just fucking anarchy. It was so fun. And yeah. the fact that Chinatown was suddenly <laughs> watching basketball, why would you blow that? Why would you not go, we want 
We have Chinatown for the first time in history. Everybody, there were t-shirts. I, it came out quick that Models just had Lynn, Lynn shirts everywhere. I remember any bar that had the name Land in it was changing the name to Lynn on the signage and shit. It was just a really fun two weeks. Roland was wearing a fucking Lynn Sanity shirt. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you doing? I didn't even know you were a basketball fan. And he said he was having fun waving to the other people with Lynn Sanity shirts. <laughs> I'll never forget him talking about that. <laughs> By the way, I want to get him um, some pizzas from that place that he loves. Okay. Because uh, he hooked up this Gervais thing for me, too. I'm on it. No, you're going to do the Gervais plug now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's happening uh, November 8th. And Sirius XM is giving away one pair of tickets to Ricky Gervais and Friends, a work in progress with Ron Bennington and Jim Norton. That's <laughs> happening at the K Playhouse at Hunter College on November 8th. For official rules and to enter, go to SiriusXM.com slash Ricky Gervais before October 31st. No additional purchase is necessary. The grand prize winner receives a trip for two to New York, includes round trip airfare, hotel, and two tickets to the show. And we'll, we'll have um, some tickets, but we won't have the airfare. So we'll let you know about that, but focus on this first. Um, are we going to break before him or just jump right into the song? We're going to jump right into the song. Oh, that's exciting, isn't it? Is it's Roger great. Daltrey of The Who. His new book, Thanks a Lot, Mr. Kibblewhite, My Story, is available now in stores and online. That's a good point. I don't, you know, it's a nutty title, but the British are the British. What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, it's a really great story, obviously, uh, about, you know, that time in England, which I'm a huge fan of all the groups that came out of there and the filmmakers and also uh let's uh let's play a little roger daltrey and bring him in roger daltrey in studio with us uh the brand new book is thanks a lot mr kibblewhite uh it's roger daltrey my story and uh, you know coming into that song did you have a feeling that decades and decades in the future would be the same story it seems to be that way, doesn't it? it does. Won't get fooled again, and again, again, and again, and again. It seems to be the story of my life. Yeah, uh, yeah, nothing. Yes. Not seems to change. It's funny, that. Yeah, well, it keeps you uh, topical. It keeps you, you know, on the edge all the time. The fact that we make zero progress as the year goes <laughs> oh, go we, by. We slow, you know, slowly we yeah. make progress, um, and sometimes we take backward steps. But yeah. slowly it does progress. So you're still somewhat optimistic after. Yeah, well, you have to be. I mean, where are you going to go? <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you had the uh, the idea to sit down and go and and write this book, were you surprised that uh, some maybe memories pop back into your head that you hadn't thought about in a while? Um. No, I mean, my, the, the thing that's astonished me is, is that my clarity on all the Who stuff, especially the shows, is incredibly, incredibly sharp. And mm -hmm. I think that's because at that time, I'm always so focused, you know right. what I mean? I'm in a zone, uh, and it, that, that remains clear. The, some of my uh, other bits of life, I've got huge bits missing, mm -hmm. um, which are kind of, that's kind of weird. Yeah. You know, my wife will say, do you remember when we did this and when we did that? and. I go no, and it's, and it's not like there's not there's, there's a flicker. There's absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I go no. <laughs> so you, but the who yeah. stuff was always in. It's, it's just always clear. And I think it's because when I'm with the band and when we're doing what we do, I'm always completely focused. Yeah, and the, your personal life, maybe we take it for granted or we act like you know that should be easier, but our work. Our work, men tend to really focus on our work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at this story, too, it's, it's amazing to me the way London changed over the course of your childhood into your teenage years. When you think about the world that you guys were born into, it was certainly a different world once the 1960s hit, wasn't it? Uh it, it was starting to become a different world. I mean, yeah. that, it's been it's been not easy to, to get Americans to understand 
the landscape that we grew up in. I mean, I was born in a V1 raid. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Blitz that happened in London, happened in 1940, was on the east end of London, the docks area. But there were all these other kind of mini Blitzes. And, and by 1944, the year I was born, uh, Hitler had invented the, the V1 flying bomb. And that's what we had raining down yeah. on West London. Um, uh, you know, my mum started started into labour on the 29th of February, determined not to have a leap year baby. <laughs> well done, <laughs> mum. She hung on for until two <laughs> o'clock in the morning on March the 1st. Uh, but she actually started labour in, in an air raid. Um, and I was born, you know, like, as I say, late, later on in, in the next day in a, in a hospital in, in Hammersmith in London. And... You know, our, my my mum and, and her sisters and all the, all the people that lived in London doing the civilian jobs in those days, they went through your nine eleven experience that right. you had in New York and indeed the world had, um, and you remember that what that did to your psyche. That was, I mean, devastating, wasn't it? Yes. They went through that night in, night out for almost five years, so you, you can only imagine the trauma they must have had to deal with in their life, you know. Yeah. So the world, my first year of life up to 1945 was easy because you're on mother's breast and that's easy. But then the second year, 1945 itself, uh, what meager rations we had during the war, we then had to share with the Germans because they were even worse off than we were. Yeah. So, and I can't, you know, again, Americans find it hard to understand because this is in the land of plenty. But a pound and a quarter of meat in 1944 was the ration of meat for a family of four for a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> make your eyes water, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's stunning. It's stunning. So needless to say, there wasn't many obese people. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, is that, okay, you grew up in that. I mean, there's still wreckage and there's rubble all well, around. Well, you know... You, my mum would go down the shelters, and you'd come up, and both ends of the street were missing. Yeah, and you would. We were very lucky that that it was both ends of our street, and there was a block of about twenty houses that were missed. The, the roofs were all damaged, and the windows blown in, but they were virtually intact. Um, but other people weren't so lucky, and there were whole acres of land just derelict and which, which became our playgrounds and um, the cover of the book is that's a kind of composite photo of a where we used to have our studio in Battersea in the 70s and they were demolishing some houses but that's what you know the end of our street looked like yeah by the time I was five and they were starting to pull down what was left standing of the houses and to rebuild and it wasn't till really the seventies that photo was taken in the seventies. So it really wasn't till the seventies that the landscape became anywhere near the, the, how you'd see it today. Mm. So I can just imagine what that generation, you know, the, your parents' generation, was thinking by the time the early sixties came around, and you guys were had some time to start playing music and enjoying life. And there's in, in London, there's suddenly photography and film and there's this kind of youth explosion. Uh, I, I can, I can't even picture how baffled they must've been. Well, they, there was a, always a kind of distance between myself and my parents. They, and, and again, I think they were shell shocked. I think. Oh, sure. Um, but they let us get on with it. But you got to. You, I need to put something in here. That, that what was wonderful about the war is it brought communities together. They had to help each other out. People had to put people up. You know, mm-hmm. four people in 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 four rooms of a house would be four families. You know, you couldn't have a. It, it, it would, that's so it brought community together, and it also uh, brought brought people together singing. Because it, during the air raids, they'd start singing to drown out the bombing, and the louder the bombing got, the louder they'd sing. And again, again that's an incredibly communal thing to do. So all through my uh, childhood, up way up until even even the uh, the, the early eighties, 
you'd hear people singing on building sites. Postman would sing, the milkman would sing. Singing would be everywhere in, in Britain. You know, and then, then the music changed in, in, in the 80s. We, the new romantics killed, the, <laughs> killed, 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 killed it so dead, you know. Uh, so that... Um, but uh, so... So that was great. So it wasn't, un, you know, they didn't feel the fact that we were forming skiffle bands and doing all this stuff. They didn't seem to see it as unusual. Yeah. We couldn't, everything we wanted, we had to either make or, you know, find a way of creating for ourselves. And that, that again, was, was really good for us. And people have said, said to me, yeah, you were really poor when you were young, weren't you? And I said, I said no. No, no, we, we didn't have much money, but we, we were incredibly wealthy because we had this fabulous community and we had enormous families and family units in those days were because people couldn't travel as far. You know, it wasn't a car, there was, it was un, you know, it, it wasn't easy to, to live 200 miles away from your parents. Mm -hmm. So it was all much more uh, communal. So we were very wealthy. We had no money, but we were wealthy. Yeah. But you bring up in the book that you felt, even as a small person, as a as a child, you almost felt like you didn't belong in this world in some way. And I wonder if that was, oh. you know, you were, une you were uneasy. I, I was, yeah, I, I used to get bullied. I was small. I'm small. Uh -huh. And the small guys always used to get bullied. Um, and, uh, and, I, and when I changed schools at the age of 11, which is when I first started to play music for myself and really take an interest in in what was then kind of Lead Belly's songs, old chain gang songs that were being played by a guy called Lonnie Donegan, uh, which, was, which was called Skiffle. That music was called Skiffle. And we all, we, we, every street had a Skiffle band. And, and so I was into that in a big way. And, and I... Moved out of my neighbourhood, only a mile and a half, maybe a mile and three quarters away. But it, the class system in England, it was very, a, a, a bit like, you know, the Afro-American community mm. before the civil rights movement. If you were working class, you never moved out of that. And I, I'm working class, London always will be. And we moved to an area that was what, what they call middle class. Um, and everybody speaks with a a very different accent, a very posh. You know, mm. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> we like some brain, brain trait. I mean, I, we should complete, like, it's, like a, it's like a foreign language to a Cockney. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a real born Cockney, but I'm a Londoner. And if you, call, if you call me anything, you call me a Cockney. And that middle class language to me was, I, didn't, I, thought, I'm, I felt so out of place. Mm. And I went to a school this grammar school, which was the top school of the lot, I passed with flying colours. But they they just wanted to teach me things that I weren't interested in. I was just interested in music and art. Um, I would have loved to, to to learn more about history and, and English. Some of the teachers were, to say the least, a little bit lacking in their responsibilities in teaching us. I mean, our English teacher, for instance, at that time, all he, for, for the kind of three years I was there, all he ever did was put his feet on the table and read read the racing paper, the <laughs> horse racing paper, and tell us to read a book. I mean, <laughs> if that taught us anything about English, I, you know, it was painful. So what a wasted opportunity for someone like me. And the music teacher didn't want to teach me about, you know, how to play music. She wanted to teach me these funny dots on a piece of paper which I did yes. not interested in at all, you know. <laughs> and as for maths, I, I I could add up, I could you know, I, I could <laughs> take care of myself, I could do enough. I, I didn't need all those I was never gonna be a, a you know a physics teacher. So it was it just drove me crazy and I really didn't fit in at all. And at what point was it just when you started to form bands that you go, okay, I have a purpose? Because I'm sure at that point you don't have a dream of becoming a professional musician. Um, um, well, you'd be surprised. I, I, 
you don't dream you're going to get where I got in my life, but mm -hmm. you dream that you, this is what you love to do most in your life and everything else kind of yeah. <laughs> takes secondary position. Um, but, but around about the age of, uh, of 17, uh, when I've now found John Muscle and Pete Townsend and things are starting to, to move and we're starting to get paid to do, to, to do gigs. Not a lot of money, but, but quite good money. Um, for, for for our age, it was fantastic. Um, you do start to dream. You think, well, if we can only be like Cliff Richard and the Shadows, you know. So you just work and work and work, and you uh, that went on. And again, by the time I'm 19, I, I'm I I got my girlfriend pregnant, and in those days you had to marry them. Uh, um, so I married her, and I desperately tried to make that marriage work, but I. I just couldn't do it. And um, it was then that I kind of had to make a decision. I thought, well, if there's two ways this can go, I can be in this marriage, which I'm not happy at, because I, I was finding it so difficult, because I wanted to be in the band, or I've got this band that I now knew uh, was quite good. We found Keith Moon, which was the missing link. And... Uh, this, you know, this band could possibly become something much bigger. Mm. So I, I thought, well, I've got the dream, I've got the marriage. Which one do I take? I took the dream because I thought if I can make the dream work, I can come back to my, you know, to my son and, and my what became my ex-wife, and I can take care of, care of them a lot better than I ever would have done if I'd stayed married and worked in a factory for the rest of my life. And as it happened, it worked out. Yeah, but it was certainly it was certainly a gamble. There it was a gamble. Yeah, life's a gamble. Yeah, and a terminal illness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you guys are getting together and playing, there's suddenly all these other bands about people the same age. Of course, the Beatles and Stones and Kinks. Was that was that s stunning to be around all these? Young people who were doing amazing things. It was, it was a fabulous time to be young. Yeah, and I mean, I'll never forget the first time I heard uh, the Beatles "Love Me Do" come across the airwaves. Um, and in those days, it had to be beamed into the UK uh, from Luxembourg because of our our wonderful BBC used to control our air airwaves, you know, with, with an iron fist, and they thought this this kind of rock music was disruptive. But when I heard Love Me Do, I thought, wow, this is a sound. What's going on here? And, of course, uh, we went on as a band called the, the Who, then the High Numbers, to support the Beatles, to support the Stones when they had their first hit records, to support the Kinks, Dusty Springfield, Jerry and the Pacemakers, all, all of them. We, we cut our teeth being the support act for those bands. And then... We just got very lucky that we 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 found a guy who'd worked for the Stones called Peter Meaden, and he recognised that there was this new fashion group coming up of, of people called Mods, mm -hmm. and all we were were another Stones alike band, you know, playing the blues. You know, there was there was one in every town that was the best one, and we were the one in our part of London, but the Stones. There was only room for one of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he said, you know, this new movement coming up, they're going to need, they're, they're going to need their band to become their band that speaks for them. And something must have clicked in Pete's head because he started to write songs for blokes, for the men, for the boys. Yeah. And the Who became a boys band rather than the girls band, which the Stones and the Beatles were. He also started to write songs from a very different uh, introspection, from from inside, with very deep stuff, you know. Very, uh, and so we walked. We literally walked into a barber shop as a Stones alike band, <laughs> and walked out as this. <laughs> You're suddenly <laughs> mad. Because inside, inside, it's the same band, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But immediately, the, all these mods 
took to us, you know. It, all of a sudden, the scooters would all start turning up at our gigs, and uh, and we became the figurehead for the for that movement. And then the small faces came along, and again they they were real mods. We were pretend. I mean, I was a pretend mod. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, a big part of the bu- uh, a part of the book, of course, is you're fighting your hair. Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't be. A, you could not be a mod with curly hair. No, no, it, it would. It, no, no, yeah. no. That was like you know, it was the equivalent of having a sexual transmitted disease. <laughs> yeah, curly hair. But I thought it was uh, so funny that I mean, your look became one of the iconic looks of the sixties and seventies. But there you are in the early part of your career, just oh. trying to fight it. Oh, the hours I used to spend with a di- dippity doo and a hair dryer. <laughs> And I can't tell you what the New York summers used to do to a curly hair. <laughs> Even a dippity doo didn't work. <laughs> but, you know, I got lucky. I, I, I met a girl that, 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 that became my wife. And the first time she woke up next to me, she screamed. <laughs> Your hair! <laughs> And I, and I went, oh, sorry, and quickly trying to head for the bathroom to straighten it. And she said, what have you done to it? I said, nothing. <laughs> trying to cover it. And she said, it's beautiful. And that's the first time I kind of had confidence in how I really was. Yeah. I mean, it was it was Heather that gave it to me. Well, I think what's also interesting is that you guys were able to evolved from this mod group doing that kind of stuff to becoming this giant rock band just this arena rock band and a lot of a lot of bands can't make those kind of transitions into the next decade well that you have to thank pete townsend for that and you have to thank his work ethic and his dedication and the fact that he he has the courage to to write from the perspective he does uh, with the vision that he does, and he seems to have some kind of prophetic vision, doesn't he? Mm. You listen to "Won't Get Fooled Again" now. I mean, you could play it, and the beards have all grown longer overnight. Are yeah. you kidding me? <laughs> uh, it's kind of like, whoa, there's some stuff there, you know. Um, so you have to hand, you know, that that progression to him. But equally, the brand, the band progressed with him and developed with him, and were willing to take the chances with him. And we, you know, a, a group, you can't quite explain how the, how the ingredients work, but it is like a, you know, it's like a chemical reaction, and you, it creates this explosion. You know, who, who you, you would never know what it would have been like if they'd have been Pete Townsend solo songs. Sure. We do know what it was like as a who. Well, also, you have to have that willingness to stay together because yeah. it is like a long car trip and people get on each other's nerves, you know, and, and there you guys are. And to to not say, screw it, I'm not going to do this anymore. Well, that's the one thing I can honestly say. They've never got on my nerves. Yeah. I've never got on my nerves. I've been, there's been times when I've been peed off with them, but I mean, yeah. that's natural, you know human behavior they've never got on my nerves and i've never ever considered that the who wouldn't wouldn't exist even when i even when i decided to say that the 1982 uh, tour of america was was the the last gonna gonna be the last tour i decided that that Mm -hmm. that was my decision on my back and i did it for a reason which you can read about in the book uh, which is very well explained i'm glad i did it I think, for some reason or the other, it was the only way to give us any kind of future. But uh, at the time, you were. But the, I had to stop. Yeah. Stop it there. You, but you were also willing to walk away from it rather than be there as a decade as well. You know, because you know. Every- well, yeah, you can't. Uh, no, if I ever feel that I'm going to go out and dial it in and go through the motions. I don't want to be there, and I don't want to do that to my audience. I remember, I remember so clearly how much, uh, how many days. I think it was about five or six weeks. I had to work on Saturday mornings to buy my first tickets to a, to a, my first rock concert, 
which was Cliff Richard and the Shadows at the Chiswick Empire. I think it was 1962. May have been 63. I think it was 62. But, um, and I, I can't imagine if he'd have dialed it in that night, how, what it would have done to me. Yeah. I would have been throwing stuff at the stage. And I don't want ever, I don't ever want to do that to my audience, ever. That's an insult. And you, as an artist, you owe it to them. And if that, that ever leaves me, that drive to give my all, to put that energy that our music demands and needs to make, to make it work, um, I'll quit. You know, I just saw you this summer doing Tommy with uh, the Boston. Oh, you Pop- saw it? Yes, and it was an unbelievable night. I mean, you were so great that night, but I also was sitting in the middle of that crowd and saw what that meant to those people. And, you know, there's plenty of people who never had the opportunity to see that done that way. So I'm watching people having tears in their eyes. They're jumping up in a... But what a piece of music. What a piece of uh, music. And I, and I was so proud of that tour because, uh, you know, it's great the way the Who do, do it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fabulous. But I think what, what I've done with that tour by adding my imagination to how I've always heard uh, an orchestra being added to rock, so it, it's it's still very much rock. Yes, it becomes a new form of classical music, and the guy who did the arrangements is 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 Beck's father, mm-hmm. um, uh, David Campbell, and I didn't want anything that could remotely sound like a keyboard playing a pad, you know. Yeah. And when you hear those arrangements, it's it. I I was so proud of that tour. I'm going to release a a, 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 a live album of it next year, and you were, because it's the fiftieth anniversary yeah. of Tommy next year. But you're literally working with different orchestras. Yeah, we have to work every with different orchestra every night. Yeah. yeah, you can't carry an orchestra it's on a, the road. That would be prohibitive. So I, I I found like the amazing thing is I'm sitting there going before the show going. I wonder if this is going to work for that very reason, you know, and. To see and hear that music, and like I said, so many people have grown up with that music, and this is their real chance. But the the the, the orchestra's just given it a completely different depth, and David Campbell has been so clever in the arrangements that, that because of this this period in Who history when when Pete was writing Tommy, he was starting to get into Eastern religion, into Maya Barber, and he studied them all ended up with Maya Barber. And some of those string parts in some of, like in Amazing Journey, for instance, uh, it's got all that Eastern influence. Yeah. And, he, and so it's, I'm so proud of that piece, and I'm really so, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Oh, it was, um, it was phenomenal. It really was. And it was also, like I said, it was so exciting to share that with so many people that uh that were feeling exactly the same way and, and yeah. I, I hope that you felt that connection i got with it those. every i mean i yeah. was i loved doing that show yeah i loved it there's something about the sound that an orchestra can bring uh when it's properly when the balance is right and you've got the rock band underneath with a with a with a great drummer a great guitarist great bass player all the harmonies harmonies vocal harmonies are so important yeah it's just magical. It's magical. It makes every kind of nerve in your body quiver. Well, that's also the other amazing thing about your life is there's so many pieces of music that mean so much to so many people. You know, so many albums that kind of went in a different direction from the albums before. So there's so many things that you can connect to. Um, that's just that's just. Genius! It's a it's a world of genius. We've, yeah, it's been we've been very fortunate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I think that you had to go through that when you were going through this book to you know to just. I see. found the book traumatic to go through. Yeah, especially the uh, the audio book because to read it to a listener, I had to relive it emotionally. All those things and. You know, when it gets to the losing Keith and all those things, it used to break me up. I could only do three hours of audio reading at a time. It, it would break me up. I would, I would be exhausted. 
you know, just by the, the emotions coming out of me. It was, it was, I found it very difficult. Yeah, well, life is hard, isn't it? Even when you have uh, a lot of success, it's still a tough, tough road. No, the only bit of life that's easy is death. <sighs> uh, are you are you glad that you had this experience though of of going back and putting this all down? Well, I, I I wanted to I wanted to write a book that gave people an idea of what it felt like to do what we did, uh, to to get an idea of what we were going through mentally. What, you know the, the individual characters in the band, what, what, what we were living through, what it felt like to stand on stage at Woodstock. You know how we, how we, you know, the whole event of Woodstock was like, you know, became history, rock history anyway. And I kind of try to give them a, a different view of it from the inside that I don't think's been done before. Um, and all the way through the book, I try and do that. What it was like to do the Super Bowl. What it was like to do the nine eleven concert, um, which stays in my head and will never leave me. The visuals of that never ever will. And, uh, and that was another because I, I wasn't there, but I was watching on television. I, I was living here in New York, but the 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 energy and the power that you guys brought to those songs, and then seeing those cops and firemen so moved. And it, it's like you talked about, there's real community. You know what I mean? Yep. You connect it through music. Uh, and you've had a lifetime. Yeah. Okay, Roger. Thank you so much. This was so good to see you again, my friend. And you. Always good. And uh, the book is Thanks a Lot, Mr. Uh, Kibble White. And it's Roger's story, but it's also the story of an entire generation and how <laughs> they move through. So thank you so much, my friend. Pleasure. I'll see you next time. Yes, it's the Bennington Show on a Friday coming up a little bit. Hell Gigs, our annual show where comedians um, talk about gigs they had that, uh, well, went sideways. Ari Shafir, Chris Gathert, uh, Rachel Feinstein, Dan Soder, Dean Del Rey, Godfrey, Dave Hill. Nikki Glazer, Joe Liss, Lenny Marcus, Tom Green. Ellie Kemper's not even a stand up. Yeah, but I thought she would be cool to get because she did improv and she like performed at UCB, so I knew there had to be some Isn't every improv show a hell gig? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, if someone says to me, Do you want to come to an improv show? I always say no. You don't like shouting out ideas at them for how they met and what store they're in? I just don't understand it, man. I just don't understand it. <laughs> I've never been to one. Oh, you got to go. <laughs> Should I just, just experience yeah, it? Yeah, take your check. <laughs> the number of people that yell out proctologist. <laughs> oh, God. And then they get mad. Like, this happens every night. Yeah, so figure out a different way of doing it. <laughs> How about this? You write your ideas down, you memorize them. Have a fucking play up there. Uh, Jim Florentine, Elaine Boozler, David Cross... Uh, Anthony uh, DeVito, Giannis Pappas, Chris Stefano. The list goes on and on. This is a really great list. Always love doing this show. I don't know what it is, and, and Gail's a big uh, fan of this too, but just hearing about someone's failure is so <laughs> funny. It's just like, if you're going to listen to somebody talk about a fight, you want them to get their ass beat, <laughs> not beat up two guys, because you know that's that's not true. But someone says, oh, did I ever tell you the time we got fucking beat up down in Alphabet City? I'm like, go on. <laughs> every uh, every story my dad had about fighting, he lost. Every He never told me the story of, of anyone he actually beat up successfully. Oh, well, you know, he was in ugly New York, too, man. So <laughs> those were stomping days. Yeah, it was It's rough. just so funny to think in New York you had to be like, oh, this is a great bar. I hope I get home safe. <laughs> <laughs> Are there cabs outside? The cabs were fucking scary enough in those days. I think the door should be the same color as the rest of the cab. They were the worst one. The cab drivers were the scariest drivers all because they draw like maniacs. Earl, did you ever work outside of radio before you ended up at Hard Rock? Um, no, just the like, sales stuff, but outside of no real job job. What do you mean radio. sales stuff? Crack? <laughs> no. <laughs> Moonrock? <laughs> Moonwork? <laughs> 
I did the um, the phone marketing thing, but nothing really. Oh, I forgot. You used to work for. I did the thing at Carnegie Hall. You know that you got me on that fucking list for years. <laughs> After you left, I'd still be getting calls from because I think I bought something through you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll buy that show, and then that was it. Fucking Carnegie Hall had me down, and I was getting fucking on the regs, just calls. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to come see some play a violin. I'm a fucking grown man. <laughs> I uh, I worked a data entry job that was fucking awful. Yeah, I remember. That's when you were interning. Yeah. And uh, I was doing that, and I was just in, inputting like uh, dental codes for hours on end, just looking at scans of dental forms that dentists would send the company, uh, and then, like inputting it into a database. It was just fucking mind numbing. Yeah, it was I bet. really bad. And then it had. So you didn't even have to have any computer skills. Oh, you no. just had to be a person who was just, just know where the number pad is on a keyboard. Yeah, that's literally all they wanted. And I was like, okay, I'll do this for fucking eight, nine dollars an hour, wherever the fuck it was. Well, you gotta fucking figure it out, Chris. Before you take the position. <laughs> and then before that, I worked one day at a crooked modeling agency uh, in Edgewater, New Jersey. Did you really thought you were pretty enough to be a model? <laughs> uh, I had to cold call teens and get them to um, uh, agree to come to the modeling agency. Oh, dude, you're going to end up in real trouble. <laughs> Looking back, I felt really bad. Like a week later, I was like, I'm not doing this again. I'm not coming back in here. They got raided by the feds. <laughs> I knew this guy uh, who he had set up an agency, a talent agency, and people would come in or they would bring their kids in, and he goes, um... Your kid has got incredible talent. He goes, let's... First thing we got to do before the studios pay any attention <laughs> is we need pictures. Now, they're expensive. They normally go for like $1,400. And then people would be like, $1,400? And you go like this. You know what? Let me think. I think I know somebody. <laughs> and the whole thing would just be that. That's exactly what the thing I was doing. Over and over and over. Was like in, I heard in the eighties, it was a big thing. They went to malls and just like grabbed kids. And were like, you should be a model. And then yeah, and then it was only to sell pictures. It was just a picture selling <laughs> business. Shop market. Yeah, that was it. You know, and they would get pictures. You know, kid would have a fucking baseball cap on and thumb up. Next one, he'd have a little suit on. And that would be it. That's all they fucking did. I have one of those like studio pictures, but it was for a communion that I had to get my studio picture done. Uh -huh. But it's me with a white jacket over my shoulder in a nice <laughs> dark room. They love to put that jacket over the shoulder. <laughs> I was also looking at um, there was I don't know if it was before the '90s, but every kid I know has the same class photo as me, where it's your face and then it's a side shot of your face above to the right. Like a mug shot? No, like it's your face and then just like... Maybe you have a twin. You didn't even know it. <laughs> I had a shitty job as a, a greeter where I had to just stand in a hallway and uh, high-fiving people was a big part of the job. And I got screamed at because I wasn't high-fiving enough people one day. What, where were you working? Disney? No, it was uh, it was the first job I had at Chelsea Piers. Oh, was like God, six, everything is Chelsea I've Piers only worked at two places. Serious? <laughs> no, know, three. Can I tell you something? When you're fucking working at a pier, you should be helping boats dock. <laughs> no, the easiest <laughs> job. <laughs> Actually, they do have a boat dock, but it's like the smallest part of the pier itself. But yeah, it, I was a greeter, and they wouldn't let me do homework at the front. I was a 16-year-old high school kid just fucking sitting there for three hours waving to people. And I'm not the person that like eight-year-olds want to wave to as they walk in for gymnastics Nobody class. Nobody wants to wave to you. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> You ready to fucking hit it? <laughs> How often did you even really wave to anyone? I started, I would wave to every single person who came in, whether they wanted it or not. All right, let's suppose Chris is walking in. What would you be doing? Be standing there, and I'd yeah. be waiting for eye contact. Okay, yeah. I'm and, walking in. And then, so waiting for eye contact, and then he walks <laughs> down, and I'm like, hey, man. What? What are you doing here, buddy? Why are you talking to me? I'm going to the Chelsea Pier. i got to work you out. A kid? No. I really don't what? think you you're really sweaty and overweight. Should you are you are you okay? All right, this went south fast, didn't it, Chris? Yell out, yell out something. It's yes and not no but. Not fat sweaty. No, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> That's literally what he did. To stop the bit. 
And then my first bartending job, they didn't pay me. They called me the minister of hospitality, and I just had to walk around and try to get people to drink. That's like your job, bro. You're the vibe manager. <laughs> Is there a union? No, no union. Oh. Hate Wait. it over there. They take advantage of the fucking place. No. Can we cancel the Christmas, I mean, the Thanksgiving gig <laughs> as a way of supporting those people. <laughs> Why can't they make a living wage, Earl? Get, get a giant ride out there. <laughs> take, the Hard Rock takes care of employees very well. Um. Oh, boy. Look, he's like a walking. <laughs> hey, Earl the Pearl is going to be here in a little bit. Earl the Pearl Monroe. And I'm going to tell you guys this. He's one of the greatest of all time. And I love him extra because just being a, you know, a Philadelphia playground legend is somebody that, you know, all of our dads would talk about and say, I want you to fucking, you know, when he gets in here, the entire time I'm going to keep a hand on him. Right? <laughs> I'm going to guarantee you he's leaving here with donut. Zero fucking points. <laughs> Earl's actually had, uh, it's a ridiculous amount of knee surgeries. Yeah, um, like, and that was pre, like you know the way they it do was these pre stretching. <laughs> 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 you, and you know, I mean, a lot of that stuff I'm sure came from playing on the fucking pavement. Yeah, too. But uh, uh, Deb from the I Bang, her dad was getting his uh, knee done like a few years ago, and. <laughs> Earl was next to him. Wow, they, really? They were sitting, yeah, he was in the <laughs> rehab next to him. I guess he lives over in Jersey. And, it was, you know, that fucking makes your rehab go a lot better. <laughs> you suddenly feel like you're a sports idol. <laughs> yeah, but they would do those knee surgeries then. They just literally just sliced it open and just started looking around as opposed to now where they got... Well, now the body is like a business itself. Like uh, LeBron puts a million dollars into his body every year. There was nobody taking care of themselves like that back then. Well, where does he spend this million? Because it uh, seems like he's wasting it. <laughs> I don't know where the million goes, but I know per year he invests one million dollars into his body. Like working out, staying healthy, vitamins, workout regimens. Doesn't sound like a million. No, wait. Well, um, what sounds name? like ten grand? <laughs> uh, Bernard Hopkins. Uh, former middleweight champion he has this procedure done where they do like this body scan and they and they target what areas have to be uh taken care of his problem areas yeah his problem areas and that's what he works on before i could do that with a little hammer on his knee (laughs) (laughs) these guys are getting ripped off well i heard fuck this is what lebron does he goes into a fucking chamber that's like super cold and that's cryogenic freezing well yeah and supposed to like make you heal faster it's that seems like the biggest fucking rip off Michael Jackson had that in fucking 1985. <laughs> Didn't help him. Didn't. He was the greatest dancer known as the pop music. Literally, he was the king of pop. And he was dancing well into like into his 50s. Yeah, well, he was all fucked up on oxies. <laughs> but just injuries in general, because like you could come back from an ACL injury now. You used to just, that, that used was, to be a career ender. Yeah, that was just it for you. And then what was the other one? That fucking Tommy John surgery. Yeah, like, yeah. that was the thing. The but, rotator cuff. But am I crazy that more guys are hurt now than were in the old days? I like th- I don't remember like fucking Steve Carlton ever being off for fucking <laughs> half of a season. He was pitching every three days. Definitely I, in football, it's ridiculous. I think the money has a lot to do with it, because and uh, players complaining more about injuries and not playing through stuff so because i think they're more focused on their contracts and making that next big lump sum that they're like fuck it i'm not going to risk getting hurt throwing more and more so you're saying they're not hurt at all i think guys are getting more like like i'm hearing stories now that high schoolers are getting the tommy john surgeries well Tommy, well, uh, dude i knew a kid who fucking needed it because when we were in uh little league they had him throwing a fucking curve, right? And your arm isn't ready for that fucking movement. So this guy who dominated Little League by the time he got to 10th grade, he was off the fucking table. <laughs> his fucking arm, he couldn't throw a ball across this room. Blew the old elbow out completely? Yeah, or what did I just <laughs> fucking explain <laughs> the like entire completely. thing? Joe Theismann probably would have had a career after. No, that no, fucking no, that, was, no, that was it, no matter what. his, <laughs> fucking his leg. Well, like, cause that kid, uh, that he had a fucking basically a Navy SEAL. <laughs> that kid from the Celtics is already back, Gordon Hayward from last year, and he fucking 
That one was... Yeah, how long is that fucking fucker going to be back? <laughs> They're just doing him a favor. It's over for that dude. Why are you rooting against them? Just I always root against the Celtics. I root against the Celtics and the Lakers. The two great fucking franchises. I'm like, oh. It's a lot of finals you're not into. I don't know. I still watch. I just bitched my way all the way through it. <laughs> Me, it was the Bulls. 80s Bulls. I never hated the Bulls. The Jordan Bulls. Oh, I How'd you hate the Jordan Bulls? It was just because they kept beating the Knicks. Yeah, but it was fun to watch. Like I've Knicks fans I've talked to from that era still say like you're still watching Jordan play. Yeah, you should hate the Pacers and fucking Reggie Miller. <laughs> Dude, I was down in in fucking uh Miami at a playoff game and people wearing heat jerseys were still cheering for fucking Jordan. They were cheering for the Heat yeah. and they were cheering for Jordan. And I was like, I don't even know where I am right now. <laughs> I know this is a fairly new franchise. But you got to care at least a little hometown. Alan Parsons project is just playing there. <laughs> that was an exciting thing. I remember I was at a Nick game and I and I'm I sat behind Charles Smith, the uh, power forward for the Knicks, and I was I couldn't even concentrate on the game because I was still mad at him for not dunking when in the, yeah. the playoff game. You got to dunk that shit. You gotta go strong, and I was, I'm just sitting. I couldn't enjoy myself because I'm sitting. And going, what, you it was do it when you were in the movie Anger Management. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron's been getting shit on this whole week because he missed foul shots, and uh, everybody keeps bringing up that Kobe wouldn't have missed those foul shots. But yes, he he's missed foul shots before. He wasn't fucking 100. percent It's not like you would have had somebody else if you didn't have LeBron. It's <laughs> not like Kobe would have been back. <laughs> you got LeBron on the downslide of his career. Congratulations, LA. Enjoy it. <laughs> Who are you getting next? David Beckham? <laughs> you know, and LA's known for that. They did it with Carl Malone. They did it with uh Steve Nash. They did it with Kareem. Kareem was had already played for years before he went to LA. Yeah, but Magic uh, kinda, Chamberlain too. Chamberlain uh, but Magic kind of resurrected helped resurrect Kareem's career a little bit. Oh, well, that can happen all the time when you go and do something, but the, uh, you know, a lot of teams will grab those guys just a little past their prime. And then they get the wisdom, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. You basically have a player coach out there. Did Steve Nash even play a season with them? Didn't he get injured right away and it didn't even matter? I think he did a full season. He when did? They had, um, it was him and Malone. He's a guy that never won a championship that people fucking... I love Steve Nash, but people, like, idolize Steve yeah, Nash. Yeah, he was a lot of fun to watch, yeah. too, though, man. I mean, like, he was exciting. He was white. <laughs> 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 they like anybody who's white. Yeah, like Brian Scalvarini on the Celtics. Yeah. People fucking go. He's they, yeah. He's, he's our Jackie phone. Robinson. <laughs> I remember that bench, that Celtics bench. It was just tall, athletic black guy, tall, athletic black guy. Brian Scalvarini, the tall, athletic black guy. Well, I think fucking basketball is definitely a sport where you can not like the team, but like somebody on the team. Yeah. You know. Like, I don't care about OKC, but I like to watch Russell Westbrook. Like, I'll just watch an OKC game to see him play. Something about, I still hate them for stealing Seattle's team. I just fucking <laughs> hate when somebody when a city steals another city's team. I never want them to get a championship. <laughs> and I want them to get a lot of tornadoes. <laughs> it's probably wrong. That <laughs> Yeah, I still get mad at the Colts when they bring up team records, and they're like, well, he, uh, I think it was Manning was breaking, they said he broke United. I said, no, he didn't. <laughs> That's the Baltimore Colts. I despise the Colts for leaving in the middle of the night. And then I despise Baltimore for taking fucking the Browns. There's two, two fucking Browns championships that the, that Cleveland didn't get. Ah, oh, this fucking country of ours, it's yeah. over. Raiders fans are fucking, I, just, I feel bad for Raiders fans. Because they really do love their team, and they're just... Dude, I, I, I'm with you, and that, to me, Oakland Raiders is it. But there's still a baseball diamond on that fucking field. <laughs> I mean, this terrible. is fucking 1968 shit. <laughs> it looks terrible when you're running past, like, the 40-yard line. And it, there's just dirt. Yeah. <laughs> Running across the pitcher's mound. <laughs> I think they take the mound down there. <laughs> they take the mound and the bases out of there. Um, all right, we got to go to a uh, break here. We've got, uh, I mean, this is pretty phenomenal when you uh, think about it, that we got Earl the Pearl Monroe coming in. Black Jesus. Uh, and he's going to be here with Dan Clores, who has uh, 
done this long documentary. I mean, it's crazy long basketball love story Tuesdays at 7 p.m. on ESPN. And I, I'm always a sucker for any sports story, any fucking sports story. And a lot of times you'll go back to them and you're like, oh, man, I forgot how much those two teams hated each other. And you see the way they elevate each other's play, you know. It's uh, Tuesday nights on ESPN. All right, we'll take a break. We're right back. This is Bennington. Basketball, a love story, airs Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. on ESPN. Uh, Dan Clores is here. He's the creative force behind this entire endeavor. And from the schoolyards of Philadelphia, Black Jesus, Earl the Pearl Monroe. What a thrill, my friend. Wow. Thank you. A producer of the film. <laughs> oh, also a producer. Yeah. So you pulled a lot of these guys in. Well, you know, Dan pulled them in. Yeah. I, I heard that Dan was doing a story, so everybody started to rush in. I'm, yeah. I just, I'm just on the coattails of Dan here. But <laughs> Dan, uh, you having such um, an amazing passion for this entire project, and this is, it's really a, a Herculean task that you put together with all this. But just to know that you hang out with Earl the Pearl Monroe now, it's got to make it all worthwhile. Well, I. I did teach Earl most of what he knows about the game. Because of me, in Earl's latest stages, he's now one of the great horse players of all time. <laughs> and he does my special triple dip bounce off the building into the rim. Well, you, you know, when you said you, you taught Earl everything he knows, I, I, I find it fascinating that everything Earl knows, nobody was doing before Earl did it. So the entire... A modern style of basketball starts right here. Uh, and, and that came out during this, uh, people understanding that. I think a little uh, Elgin and Connie Hawkins a little yeah. bit before Earl. but and, and also guys that we are not really familiar with, that popular culture isn't familiar with. I mean, yeah. and, and Earl could address. There are guys at the black schools. There's guys playing ball that never even had a chance to be in the pros that were that were that were. F innovating don't you think well earl let me ask you that did you a lot of this did you just pick up playing on on the street street ball for the most part yeah um you know it was mostly trial and error yeah um i didn't really start playing basketball till i was about 14 that doesn't make sense so you know it was <laughs> <laughs> so you know i wasn't very good uh -huh. um so when you think about it, um, you know, I had to kind of look at people, see what they were doing and try it out and then, you know, discard those things that weren't working for me and try to keep those things that did. Um, certainly, like Dan said, there are a lot of other guys that played the game, you know, but, you know, I was probably the, the, the guy that they said that, OK, we're going to let this guy go and do what he does. And and uh, I was able to put it in front of the, the masses. Right. And uh, to be accepted. Well, you know, in the in the same way of uh, Pele did with soccer, this is this style that Earl had. This is when it became the beautiful game. If you look at it before then, it was almost like a military precision to passing and moving the ball. But this flow, this beautiful flow, that, that changed the game. Yeah, yeah. And guys like Pistol also. Right. You know, and, uh, but what's interesting about the game, don't you think, is that the basics have always been the same. Right. You put it in a basket, and you stop people from putting it in a basket. <laughs> right. You know? That's the game. That's the game. That's the game. That's why when you're a little kid, you can start playing the game right away. You know, but to move along and see just uh, how complicated it gets and just the tiny, tiny, tiny thing between an, uh, a good player and a great player and then a great player and a legendary player. These aren't giant talent leaps, right? This is something that just takes place. Uh, who, who are the people that when you were a kid playing, when did you realize, okay, this could go on? past school bit of basketball <laughs> well i don't think i really you know i kind of took that everything in stride uh when i thought about it when i graduated from high school i guess um yeah. i had actually led the uh, public league in scoring that year 
and I decided not to go to college. I was going to go try out for the old ABL. Uh-huh. And um, for I guess uh, fortunately for me, uh, when I went to go try out for it, uh, the league folded. So, <laughs> 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 so it led me to try and do some other things and whatnot, which led me down to Winston-Salem State. Uh, and then even when you were playing in college, did you think, oh, the, 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 you know, I could make it to the NBA or again, just playing that by ear? Well, you know, in Philadelphia, where I'm from, yeah. um, you know, we played against a lot of the pros right. and, you know, you kind of felt you knew where you were by that time. Um, and, you know, <laughs> averaging 40 points a game in my senior year didn't help, <laughs> didn't hurt, you know, too much, you know. So, yeah, I, I knew I was going to go yeah. to the pros. Um, I, you know, it was just uh, a matter of time. The interesting thing about that is, though, there were only 12 teams, I think, at, at that time. Right. And you also had a quota system. So, you know, yeah, you might go to pros or you might go to Eastern League. So right. it was that one of those kind of uh, mindsets. I think because there was 12 teams, every team looks like an all-star team back in those days. You know what I mean? No matter who you were playing, it looks like it was set up. Like each squad was a legendary uh, team. Except for the Knicks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had 82 games, so you played everybody about 10 times a game. <laughs> there was also uh, a kind of a legendary thing when you and the Philly uh Street ballers came up to Rucker Park in in, in Harlem. Um, is that something that you had heard about in Philly, or did they invite you up for that? Or well, it was just what was going on every year. You yeah, know, Philadelphia, the Philadelphia New York games, and those are games that have been going on since the fifties. Right, and um, you know you're just lucky to be chosen to go. Um, I was fortunate to get a chance to get out there and play, play with some great players. Uh, of course, we played against some great players from here when, you know, Kareem was yeah. the Sender and, and all those guys. And it was, uh, it was, it was a battle. Yeah. And uh, that's a good thing about it because, you know, when you played against guys and you know what they can do and you know what you could do against them, it gives you the confidence to move ahead. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, Basketball Love Story airs Tuesday nights, 7 p.m. on ESPN. And uh, the whole series is in, uh, is available on the ESPN app. Uh, Dan, uh, how did you decide to tell the story in the way that you did? It's like a group of short stories yeah, put thank together. You. It, it is. I, I didn't want to do... First of all, 20 hours is not enough to tell the history of basketball. Mm -hmm. You need, I don't know what, 80 hours. So <laughs> so I didn't want to get caught up in that. Oh, you forgot the Elon in 1968. You know? Right. And a great player. You know? <laughs> you know? So, so I zeroed in on the stories that I wanted to tell. That's what it is. It's short stories. And it spans not in a chronological order, but it's from Naismith to right now to step curry into lebron and i was able to innovate and come up with ideas for stories that have nothing to do with great rivalries or individuals it's a you know like signature moves earl describing his spin iverson his crossover bradley moving without the ball lebron rim to rim curry on his three tarasi on her two that type of stuff and uh, when the coach finally wins does he find feel joy or relief yeah i mean on camera pat riley breaks down in tears he does not stop crying over that subject matter or a genius gene when you're that great when you're earl monroe or bill russell or michael jordan are you born with a genius gene do you have one or is it just talent you know a gift so i'm able i was able to do all the things i wanted most of the things i wanted to do you just gave me an idea before speaking to earl now i'm <laughs> now i'm really pissed off that i didn't do a scene or something like that <laughs> uh, <laughs> like I, and now i'm really pissed off i'm serious yeah. <laughs> oh you mean the records uh, no no uh, not that you know yeah. you're asking when earl's talking about you know not going to college right away and you know the Guys in Philadelphia knowing how good he is, and then he became Earl. But I got a friend, still one of my best friends to this day, and he scored 44 points in high school in one half right. against Calvin Murphy. <laughs> and I introduced him the other night at the premiere. Mm -hmm. Calvin, you bet he remembered it. <laughs> but he had issues. 
and that right. was it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a certain amount of fate that takes place, and then there's a certain you know you bring up the term genius, and I always kind of equate it to music. You know what I mean? When did Miles Davis become? Miles Davis. He was a kid who was a great trumpet player, but then suddenly this strange transition takes place, and I think that's what happens with basketball. Again, you know, at some point that happens. Well, I think that, you know, success in something makes you realize that you're doing something different. Um, When people start to appreciate what you do and start talking about it, it gives you a different outlook on what it is that you're doing. Certainly, you're just playing. As a a player, you just play. Mm -hmm. Now, when when people are out there saying, oh, did you did you do this or did you see that did you know you were doing this then you start thinking about what you're doing and it's it it is something to finally wake up and say hey I'm good yeah you know uh I've got to work at this I've got to do something about this here and see where you can take it but also there's this thing that you're not you're also an entertainer not just an athlete but you guys brought entertainment to the game and that you know the the knicks of the early 70s i mean this was uh, you know this was the beatles in some way when you guys traveled people showed up like it was uh, like it was a rock and roll show well you know the knicks were one of the most celebrated teams during that time and yeah. you, you even though you had the boston's the la's and things of that nature still there was all the people that cared about uh wall you know wall street or whatever was right here in new york right and so consequently the the knicks uh, had a great following everywhere you know when i was a bullet it used to be, i used to just you know, be real mad because we were playing the Knicks <laughs> and all the people in the stands, we we're at home and all the people in the stands are cheering for the Knicks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the major difference, right, in not playing in, let's say, New York or L.A. And it's still true to this day, right? That if you're so? playing somewhere else, smaller market, it's tougher to get the kind of... Same kind of love. I think back in those days, yes, but yeah. I think with you know I'm social sure media right and all the rest yeah. of the things yeah. that are happening today, I think you find free agents going yeah. anywhere now. Yeah, because the money is the money today, right? <laughs> you see, you know, well, you you're know, going to get it regardless. You, you, the, <laughs> when Earl, what I do in the film a lot is I try to pay attention to championship teams because they're different, and especially championship teams that no one really pays attention to, pro and college. I mean, no one goes around talking about University of Florida winning two in a row. Mm-hmm. I mean, but but they have the same characteristics emotionally and mentally as Knicks 70-73, Celtics, right? Yeah. You, to win a championship is not, at, not merely about players' ability on the court, right, Earl? Yeah. It's so much more complicated and simple, actually. Yeah, and, and it's a belief in the players that are around you as well. You going into games, you know, there are games that I've gone into, whereas I, I realize that no, we're not going to win this game. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know. But you know, during the course of a game, you you'll see what you can do and what you can't do, and what our guys are doing. You know, against those other guys, and you get the confidence to know that hey, we could pull this off. And you know, it's it's, it's never like just cut and dry, especially when you're talking about the championships. Uh, I don't think the game's ever been as popular as it is today. Am I right about that? It just seems like every year it just seems to peak more and more. Why do you think that is, Dan? I think there's a lot of reasons. And actually, David Fork says in the film, I did 165 interviews, he says there's more people playing basketball in China every day, 300 million that there are living in the United States. So... There's a lot of reasons. I mean, I think basketball, it's one of the reasons I made the film. It's much more relatable to the everyday person, the person that played him or herself. You're out there by yourself. You don't need anything but the ball and a, and a hoop. You know, you don't even need a hoop sometimes. You know, you need, you know, I played at the bottom of a fire escape ladder, you know, when I first started, right? So it's relatable. It's relatable to fans. They get the, they think they know the players. This has always been, you not don't have a helmet, shoulder pads, baseball cap on. 
You know, you could follow it easily. It's not like hockey on television, right? Mm-hmm. And and then I think it's particularly it's it's a success story about American popular culture and therefore about American business and innovation. And that helps spread the word. Unbelievable leadership. And it's related to popular culture. It's related to race relations. It's related to politics. And mostly in a very positive, progressive way, you know? Yeah, and there's always there's always a sense of cool uh, that's involved with the with with the star players and always a sense of cool you know we're, we're sitting next to you know uh, mr cool mr perception of cool he's, yeah in real life he's kind of boring and all that <laughs> stuff. but but you know his perception is earl of pearl but um <laughs> yeah or clive fraser well clive, well, clive fraser, fraser right? is unbelievably cool and i have a big scene on that yeah. on both of them called self-expression the relationship between hoops style fashion, music, language. So it begins with Clyde Frazier. I didn't want to tell the same 70s story, Willis walking out in the court. Everyone's done that, you know? Yeah. So I'm doing it on Clyde Frazier to Frank Sinatra's Mr. Success. That's <laughs> yeah. the way it begins. And from him, I go to I go to Pistol Pete and his influence and Calvin Murphy and Earl Monroe up to crazy Dennis Rodman singing happy birthday to that maniac in North Korea, <laughs> yeah. to uh, Tess Rappin, you know, who the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To basketball wives <laughs> when they're beating the hell out of each other. <laughs> yeah. And the shoe story is always there, right? The fact that these guys can move product, it's Unbelievable. Stunning. It's it's really, it, look, it's a, Earl says it in the film, I think he says the, what do you say, a $5 billion business, NBA merchandising mm-hmm. or the NCAA. I mean, it's a billion, billions and billions of dollars. And, uh, you know, I did, I did like, uh, well, I said, to, what's new? What's, what's the newest thing? And uh, Adam Silver uh, pointed out, and I use it in the film, and, and uh, he, he's speaking at the NBA Tech Summit, and all of a sudden, here comes Naismith walking out on the floor you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> to shake his hand. Man. So you could be able to watch games. Man. Right? Man. I mean, I don't want to see Naismith play, but if Earl comes back. I mean. yeah. um, but Dan, as you're putting this together and it's 20 hours, there had to be times where you're thinking, oh my God, there's just too much here, too many interviews to this thing and there had to be times where it didn't feel like it was going to come together well it started as 10 hours yeah then 12 <laughs> then i want to bet there's a true story i don't yeah. know how much time you got i want to bet with john skipper the great chairman of espn we're in a car coming in la from bob Iger's home and skipper grew up a in north carolina southern gentleman well-read southern drawl North Carolina freak. He loves UNC. But he says to me in the car, and there's two other people in it, he says, you know, my favorite player was went to NC State. So I said, I'm sitting in the back on the L.A. freeway. I said, John, if I guess, no hints, you give me another two hours? Oh, absolutely, Dan. You'll never guess it. And I said, Eddie Bean back. So that was how it became 14 hours. <laughs> then I got six, but they didn't give me enough money. So, <laughs> so I had to struggle. I'm still struggling to pay my bills. <laughs> it is a, a phenomenal amount of stories, though, isn't it? It's an endless amount of of stories in basketball. Thank you. Yeah, there are, man. Yeah. You could, I could do this again with another 62 stories right yeah you know like uh it, it really really could it, it, it was a joy making it it, it really was it was yeah. just a i mean i loved i mean i'm sitting with bill russell for five and a half hours man yeah you know oscar robinson for six and, and i hate stereotypes oh oscar's this and that. but he was just beyond intelligent and direct you know man and russell just i mean you know what russell yeah. told me I asked him about the, him being a genius, and he said no, and Oscar said no too, and and but Russell said this. He says there was a period for years in college and pros. This is Russell talking, where I remembered he's using he the movie every play of every game I ever played in, and then he said yeah. the pressure got too much. Now, what's that? Right. What's working in his mind that's different than anyone else's? Do you believe that, Earl? 
Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Russ can talk. Yeah, he can talk, man. He can talk. <laughs> By the way, I believe it, but if I didn't, I wasn't going to say it. Yeah. <laughs> but, Earl, there's always that head game that takes place on the court, too, right? You guys got to know each other so well that it's that, that there's a constant chess game going on yeah well you know you get to play against guys a, a, a number of times uh you know he used to always say that if there's a guy coming in town or there's a team coming in town and you know what you could do against a guy where you're going to really go in and really knock him out or whatever the case may be you <laughs> you go to the airport and you bring him to the hotel to make sure he gets there. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so, you know, those are the kind of head games that we used to, do. We used to play with guys. We used to call them and, and, and so forth. And, and then like Gervin, you know, these, you know, guys like that. Back in those days, you know, guy, the team stayed in town, right? you know, overnight. And like George, he played a ping pong and a couple other guys played ping pong. So after the game, we come up to my house and go up to my top floor and we play ping pong until they have to go catch a flight back the next day. So the camaraderie of what we had back in those days, I think, is a lot different than what they have today because they're in on a flight right. and they're gone after the flight. Yeah. And you guys all knew each other on the court and off the court. And uh, I, I, I look back. You guys were flying commercial. In those days too, right? Yeah, you know it's everybody insane. with the everybody with the Knicks. <laughs> 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 you know, you you have to understand that the Knicks were, you know, they were. Everybody hated them because they had all the <laughs> the uh, amenities that yeah. the rest of the teams didn't have. I mean, we would come in from from Baltimore, and uh, we would fly Northwest or not Northwest North Central Airlines, and one of the times the window blew out, and they had. A, <laughs> <laughs> and they had to put a board up uh, uh, to the window to keep everything from going out. And so, <laughs> or Allegheny or whatever, you know. <laughs> you know, guys still, you know, in the film, because there's still grudges. I mean, Unseld, Wes Unseld says in the film, to this day, I still hate Rick Barry. He says that. <laughs> well, he, he says it, man. Well, we yeah. all hate Rick Barry. <laughs> Not uh, Rick Barry. <laughs> congratulations, Dan. Thank this you so much. Unbelievable thing. Basketball, a love story, airing Tuesday yeah. nights, 7 p.m. on ESPN. By the way, Jackie McMullen, I got to plug it. She got the book. An yeah. oral history, basketball love story. She wrote the accompanying book. It's it's a beautiful book. Thank you. Thank um, you. Entire yeah. series available now on the ESPN app. And one of the great pleasures of my life mm. to say hello to Earl the Pearl. Thank Monroe. you. Thank you so Thank much, you. my friend. Appreciate we'll see you guys it. next time. Earl the Pearl Monroe. How much fun was that, man? And uh, also uh, with him, a... Uh, a guy who put together love story, basketball love story. Dan Clores. Yeah, because I don't have it on mine. I should get everything on mine that you have in your sheet. And I'll be able to say stuff too like you do. That's an oversight. Yeah, that's okay. Hell Gigs is next. When we come back from break, it's going to be Hell Gigs, and you're going to hear names like Ari Shafir, Chris Stefano. Giannis Pappas, Big J, Elaine Boozler, Ellie Kemper. There's 28 different comedians on the Hell Gig special. Mm, Ellie Kemper. Ellie Kemper from The Office and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and her new book, My Squirrel Days. All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, when we come back, uh, I'm going to tell you the truth. Vito's done a fantastic uh, job with this. It's Hell Gigs on The Bennington Show. Welcome to Hell Gigs. I am Ron Bennington. And we do have 28 different comedians talking about their Hell Gigs. And to people outside the world of comedy, a Hell Gig is just a bad day at work. It is a comedy show that you have been booked. And the feeling is there's just no possible way to make this work. For some reason, there is nothing I find funnier than hell gig stories. As a matter of fact, that just before I came in here, I ran into Big J on the street, and 
he told me that he was just did a bad bar show about a week and a half ago. Here's a guy with comedy specials. It doesn't matter. You can still fall into an audience or a room that is just not going to work. And I just find it the funniest thing in the world. It's like if someone told you that they won a fist fight, you would not be listening. But if they told you how they got beat up, you're paying close attention. So this is uh, Hell Gigs. And I want to start this off with a guy who's got uh, the special double negative streaming on Netflix uh, right now. And he's one of the funniest human beings working today. This is Ari Shafir on Hell Gigs. Me and Rogan. This was, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. We were doing uh, Faneuil Hall at, uh, in Boston, and then we went afterwards to do this place in Chicopee, Massachusetts, this Chinese restaurant slash show. It was so awful. Dude, people came up to me on stage. This dude came up to me on stage and was like, I want to take a picture with you. Like, while I was on. And I was like, what? And this was before selfies. We had to, like, aim his, his camera at himself, his, like, flip phone. No security at all. People were eating Chinese food. Afterwards... Oh, so bad. I'll never go back to that place. The Hooky Lao. Fuck that place. Oh, anyway, afterwards, I mean, this is rural Massachusetts. We're leaving, and some lady, like 45, 50 years old, we're leaving. She's like, you guys were great. And we're like, oh, thanks. Like, let's get out of here already. Let's get out of this fucking town. And she goes, oh, you want to see my tits, don't you? And we're all, all of us, we're like, no, we do not. And she goes, well, here you go then. We're like, but we just said no. It was like talking to one of those 9-11 truthers when you're like, I'm not interested in this. And they're like, I'm still going to tell you. And she goes, here you go. She lifted her shirt. She got to the belly button before you could start seeing nipple. I mean, that's how low-hanging they were. It was so disgusting. We could not handle it. It was gross. I will never be back to that hooky lao fucking bar in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Fuck that place. Fuck the Red Sox. Ari Shafir is adamant. That's it for him. He's not going back. At Ari Shafir on Twitter. Truly one of the funniest people uh, working today. I don't know how... It became more about breasts than the show, but he remembers it. I'm sure there's plenty of great shows that he's forgotten over the years, but he remembers the hooky lao. Uh, next up is, well, he's the new kid on the block. Everybody's talking about him. It's Bo Burnham. He's got a um, movie that you can watch now on DVD, Blu-ray, and on demand called Eighth grade, there's a lot of people thinking that uh, he could end up with an Academy Award nomination. But every day wasn't good. This is Bo Burnham talking about a hell gig. My hell gig was I replaced Pitbull at the University of Central Florida last minute at an outdoor carnival. I landed in Florida and there were a bunch of tweets of people saying they wanted to throw bottles at my head. And so I got on stage and I wore a bunch of... <laughs> the school's gear so they because i thought they might want not want to throw bottles at their own logo and i got through it somehow but i threw up backstage and i realized that like i was actually truly terrified for my safety and now i realized that it's fine to bomb as long as i don't get a bottle in my head at bo burnham at bo burnham on twitter not every day has been a good day for bo this is a gentleman who Man, most of the things that he talks about are failure and panic and depression. So I can't wait to hear his hell gig. Uh, he's got a new book out called Lose Well. It's available now in stores and online. It's the one and only Chris Gethard. There's a great show called Hot Soup on Tuesday nights in New York City. Before I taped my Comedy Central half hour, the booker, Jeremy said, hey, why don't you come do the full half hour at Hot Soup? And I was like, thank you. You know, full half hour stage time in New York City, that's very generous, very nice. Unfortunately, that night, a maniac attended, and he was disruptive the whole night, and he stood right next to the stage. It was like half seated, half standing. He stood right next to the stage, and he was probably like six foot two, six foot three, and he just loudly ate French onion soup the entire time. And then while I was about halfway through the story, he started saying the words, bust a nut, over and over and over again, just bust a nut, bust a nut, bust. And I finally was like, 
what is the deal? He was ruining everything. And I was pretty pissed because he had, he had messed with a lot of the comics. And it was funny, though, because he, he turns to me. I'm like, why do you think you have a right to do this? He's like, well, I'm a comic, too, and I'm funnier than all you guys. And I was like, that can't be true. That you, There's a special layer of hell for you if that's true. And I wound up saying to him, I backed him into a corner because I was like, fine, take the mic. And he was like, what? And I was like, if you're funnier than me, no one in here will be mad. But if you're not, after the way you've behaved tonight... This crowd's gonna eat you alive, dude. So I actually just bailed on my set and handed that dude the mic, and then he, I mean, someone actually tried to fist fight him on his way out the door. So it was a, it was a, it was a show that I was very excited to do that was destroyed by a crazy person utilizing French onion soup as a weapon, and then I just bailed and handed him the mic, which is never how you want it to end with a heckler, but in the end it turned out okay. But that one was really pretty grim bust the nut um <laughs> at chris gethard at chris gethard if you want to tweet him by the way the guy the heckler that was yelling bust the nut over and over was none other than colin quinn so <laughs> it all it all works this next comedian is so amazingly funny She's doing a podcast with Amy Schumer, Keith Robinson, and Bridget Everett called Three Girls, One Keith that's streaming on Spotify. She's also the ambassador for the Hotel Tonight app, the one and only and newly married, hilarious Rachel Feinstein. My whole gig is uh, one time I had to play at like a culinary institute. I was supposed to do stand up and um, someone threw a soft taco at me. And it was a sad throw, too, because a soft taco just kind of falls off your tittage, sadly, onto the ground. It didn't even make, like, a satisfying sound. But I did have a soft taco thrown right at one of my cans. <laughs> a soft taco in the tittage. That's our at Rachel Feinstein. At Rachel Feinstein. Um, yeah, don't throw food, kids, no matter what you think of the ad. Don't throw food. Um, this next uh, gentleman, Stavros Hakias, he's got the big podcast, Come Town, uh, available on Apple Podcasts, and it's got all the youngsters uh, talking about it right now. So uh, let's welcome him to Hell Gigs. My Hell Gig is, and this just happened to me actually, is I was at this great venue in Chicago and things are going great three sold out shows I'm so pumped Saturday rolls around and there's just a drunk woman in the crowd she's got a guy with her and she's just yapping 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 I tell her to shut up and I really you know I just truly eviscerate her and it feels great and then she's back for the second show she's drunker She's on Xanax now, I believe, and she just keeps, she's yelling, she's popping her titties out, and she's going crazy. And now, full disclosure, she had sent me nudes, and I think she thought that entitled her to just yell out during the show, but it did not. I have a very strict policy. If you send me a titty, I will look at a titty, but that does not allow you to yell at my show. The, the manager tried to kick her out. He couldn't. She was, let's just say... Uh, the manager was a small man, and she was in a couple weight classes above him. <laughs> they couldn't kick her out. I end the show. She tries to come to the, like, I'm taking pictures with people afterwards. She would, she refused to leave. They have to kick her out. She's blocking the exit with her body. She takes, she's just laying there with her tits out in the middle of the sidewalk in Chicago. Finally, they put her into a lift, and I uh, just got high with members of the theater that I was at until 3 a.m. So that was a hell gig. It was fun, but also hellish to deal with for sure. He's Stavi Baby 2 on Instagram, Stavi Baby 2. And uh, hell gigs has been uh, way more about breasts than I ever <laughs> imagined. It seemed like breasts are playing a really, really big part of this. So. Uh, all right, up next, you know him from the Bonfire on Comedy Central Radio. He also hosts uh, Legion of Skanks, and uh, he's part of the new Degenerates on Netflix will be available to stream starting Tuesday, October 30th. He's everybody's favorite comic, but it doesn't mean he's not going to do the occasional hell gig. My worst hell gig was... I believe it was, I did a place called Sweet Cheeks, hosted by Kevin Hart when I was younger, uh, very young in comedy, and show started at 3 in the morning. 
They hated white people. Uh, they let me know they hated it by throwing bread at me. And then I left the stage. And then Kevin Hart convinced me to go back on stage, at which point they threw chicken at me. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get paid, but I did get chicken grease on my shiny white sneakers that I ironically bought so black people would like me more. Let's uh, just jump right back into his partner on the bonfire, Dan Soder. He's got a 30-minute special as part of Netflix, the stand-up series, which is streaming right now. This is Dan Soder and his hell gig. Uh, one of the worst gigs I ever had was a bar show in Connecticut where I walked in and there were four people at the bar the bartender, a sound guy, and two people who never turned towards the stage, and I had to do 30 minutes, and the promoter paid me $100, and I've never recovered. Yeah, this, uh, there's a lot of scars on the souls of these comedians. This is Hell Gigs, a, just the worst, terrible night when you're doing uh, stand-up. That makes you feel like you've passed into the eighth gate of hell. This is Lisa Lampanelli. Her show, uh, Losing It, is happening November 11th at the Gramercy Theater in New York City as part of the New York Comedy Festival. Go to lisalampanelli.com for tickets. Lisa Lampanelli, what was your hell gig? Uh, it's hard to narrow down what my worst comedy gig ever. There was the one where I drove up to the place and there was a Confederate flag outside, which you'd think for an insult comic, that'd be a good thing. But it really was not because insult comedy is mostly about tolerating everyone around you. So, And also the fact that they, it was like the Phillies were in the World Series or the playoffs and it was down there. And um, guess what? The playoffs were during my show and they shut off the screens. So guess how much love was coming my way? Another one was when I was up there doing my thing and my whole family was there, so I wanted to prove that I had some self-worth as a human being, that I could do comedy. And when the next guy get up there, the guy was sucking wind. He was eating his own cock, as uh, Edith Wharton famously said. And uh, somebody yells, bring back the fat chick. And in a way, that's a compliment, because the guy said bring back, but with someone with low self-esteem, all I heard was the fat chick. And I'm like, oh, great, now I'm just the fat chick for the rest of my life. There's many to choose from, but I have to say... In all honesty, any gig where I'm with Jeff Ross is the worst because he's so ugly that I can't even see straight. Love you. Happy Halloween. At Lisa Lampanelli. At Lisa Lampanelli. And go to lisalampanelli.com for tickets and all of Lisa's uh, dates. Um, Ted Alexandro has got a brand new special called Senior Class of Earth that's available to rent and buy on atcspecials.com. And let's find out about Ted Alexandro's hell gig. My hell gig is uh, I had to do this corporate for Anheuser-Busch uh, Budweiser. And it was, this is probably 15 years ago or so, and I was not equipped to be in front of this group of people. They, they were like truck drivers for Anheuser-Busch and I probably had about barely had 30 minutes and I had to do 45 for truck drivers and a lot of my stuff was about teaching children the recorder uh, and there were just women walking around in bathing suits like the Bud Girls uh, so there was a beer the beer was flowing and my jokes were, were not so that was a that was a particularly rough one at Ted Alexandro at Ted Alexandro uh, this is Hell Gigs. Uh, one of my favorite comics, Dean Del Rey, does a podcast, Let There Be Talk, and that's available on iTunes and at deandelrey.com. But Dean has traveled the world, uh, first with music, then with comedy, so I'm sure he's had quite a few Hell Gigs. Here's my hell gig. Around two years into doing comedy, a guy asked me to do a gig, and he didn't really say much about it. He goes, "Oh, it's going to pay a hundred bucks. I'll give you a ride. It's it's going to be great. You know, the, it's going to be packed." That's what he kept saying. It's going to be packed, and you get to do twenty minutes. And at the time, to do twenty minutes is like gold for a new comic because you're only doing three to five minutes. 
So he gives me a ride. We go out to uh, some weird town in, called Lancaster. And we get there, and it's in a hotel. And I'm like, okay. Is, I go, is it a club or a bar or what is this? And he goes, oh, it's in here. And we go in this ballroom, and it is a real estate convention. And it's no stage. They're just eating all at tables, dinner. And now I'm the entertainment for the real estate convention. And not only is it the real estate convention, it's the Asian real estate convention. So it's all like middle-aged Asian people. Now I've got to do 20 minutes and, and no, no less because 20 is how you get paid. And I'm in the middle with a wireless mic with the, some dumb speaker and they're just standing there and I'm doing it in 360 like Def Leppard in the round because they're kind of all sitting and tables all around. So I'm just kind of going around and I'm doing jokes and no one's laughing. No one. And I have to keep going. Now I've run out of bits because they're not laughing. My supposed 20 minutes is gone in like six. And now I'm just talking and they just resume eating and just not even watching anymore. And I just stayed up there and I just kept looking at my watch and I was like, okay, thanks. And I, I got out of there. No one even knew I left or nothing. It was a nightmare. At Dean Del Rey, at Dean Del Rey. My favorite part of that is that his 20 minutes went by in six minutes because there was no laughter. He had timed that 20 minutes for, yeah, there's going to be some laughs here, so I'll pause. But let me tell you something. There had to be something wrong with those people. You're not laughing at Dean Del Rey. Next up is uh, an extremely, extremely funny guy, Dave Hill. His band... Valley Lodge has a new album called Fog Machine that's available on Amazon.com and all streaming services. Let's listen to Mr. Dave Hill. My hell gig is um, a few years ago I was asked to host and do comedy with a Weezer tribute band in Williamsburg. And I thought it was a bad idea, but I'd said yes anyway. It ended up being really fun at first. I went on, then a band played, then I went on again, and then all these people wanted the Weezer tribute band to come on, <laughs> and definitely were like, why is that guy talking? And usually I never drink before I go on stage, but this night I decided I was going to drink just because I was just like really dreading it. So I had a few beers. Someone threw like a quarter, some coin, and it hit me in the face. Sober Dave would have uh, just walked off stage and been like, oh, I'm going to get out of here now. But uh, Drunk Dave was like, I wanted to bring my assailant to justice. <laughs> so I was like, who did that? Like a substitute teacher. And I'm like, yeah, get, let's get this person up here. And half the crowd was like, shut the fuck up, you know. And the other half was like, yeah, get him up there. So I was like, come on, get up here. And um, as I'm doing that, and that went on for a couple of minutes, <laughs> Someone threw another coin, and that hit me. And then, so the band, by this point, was already on stage, like, ready to go on. And I'm introducing them. But I was so pissed off when I got hit with the, se the second coin. And the band had these, like, big plastic cups of beer at the lip of the stage, you know. So when I got hit by the second coin, I was like, okay, I'm going to get off stage, but I'm going to throw all their beers on the audience, which, to my mind didn't think that was that big of a deal because I thought, oh, like, it's rock and roll, whatever. But the audience didn't like it at all. <laughs> and so they start throwing cups at me. I go over to the bar. I start throwing more cups back at them. And then the bartender, understandably, was like, you got to get out of here. And so I was like, yeah, you're right. And then I decided, you know, this night has just been so stupid and I've behaved like an absolute idiot. He was wearing a trucker hat. So I was like, I'm just going to take this guy's hat just to make tonight worse. <laughs> and so I took his hat and I started tearing down the street. Then like five guys, they chased me and I fell and I threw the hat away from me thinking it would create a diversion and it worked. And then some guy grabbed me and I was like, I thought he was going to kick my ass. And he's like, I was like, yeah, it's all over. It's really stupid. And he, I was, I'm like, you don't need to fight me or anything. And he's like, no, I, you're Dave Hill. 
right? And I was like, well, yeah. And he's like, I, I saw what happened back there. Those people are assholes. You didn't deserve that. <laughs> like, So I was like, yeah, you're right. Let's go back and get my money. So we went back, and uh, this guy was huge. And so he got the venue to pay me. So it all worked out. I'm not proud of any of that. It's pathetic, but that's my worst gig, my hell gig. Uh, Dave Hill, and for the first time tonight, I think he was the responsible one. Not the venue, not the crowd. Dave Hill. Now, by the way, when he brought up about hit being hit in the face with change, uh, the person who threw the first coin, not the second coin, but the first coin, was Colin Quinn. <laughs> Uh, this is a guy that we all love. Uh, he works here at uh, Sirius XM. Um, he does his show, The Power Hour, on Urban View. He's also one of the hottest comics working in the city today. And by that, I just don't mean just funny. He's also a beautiful, beautiful man. It's Godfrey. My hell gig is when I was in Stamford, Connecticut, I did this gig. I didn't even know what to expect. I just know I was in Stamford. You know where they film like the Jerry Springers and all that other stuff. Stamford, Connecticut, and it's me and this other comic, and we go into a nightclub. I'm like, okay, where is the show going to be? And the nightclub had a runway. That was a stage runway. First of all, runway stage is the is a nightmare for comedians. So it was a runway, and it was just all Italian guys. They were all on steroids. They all wore silk shirts with medallions. It was probably the worst gig. They didn't turn the music down, so we had to do comedy while the music was playing. It was the worst. It, what was funny was the guy that opened up for me, that opened up first, he had to do like 15 minutes. These dudes were literally dancing while he was telling jokes. He was literally just trying to stick with his act. But these guys were towns. They were all on steroids. They were on roids. Their girlfriends were drunk. Everybody was drunk. And every time, every punchline this guy had, all they did was go, hoo, 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 hoo. it was the funniest. And I was like, okay, so what am I going to do now? These Italian dudes, they were just like, yo, man, get something to drink. This dude's like, so my mom's a Catholic. Fuck your mom. We don't give a shit about that. Hoo, hoo. They were just dancing. It was just like electronic music. So I go, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to fuck with these dudes you know what i mean so i just went with the flow i just started talking about these dudes and all they, and it was just like as i got on stage more muscular italian dudes came into the club and they were just started to dance they were just like yo talk about my friend right here this guy's a fucking idiot i just i just pretty much they instructed me who to talk about and then i go hey guys have you guys been to college they all go fuck no they just go fuck no. We were in junior college and we didn't even fucking finish. NNC, NNC. They were yelling out the junior college that they all dropped out from. They just kept putting drinks on the stage, making me take shots with them. That was the fucking gig. <laughs> uh, Godfrey and his Hell Gig stories. If you're just joining us, Hell Gig is one of those shows that a comedian's doing uh, when they believe that they are in hell. Um, next up, and I don't know what she's going to pick, but I believe it's going to be Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> it's our own Nikki Glazer. The gig that I would most like to never relive was a women in cable conference that I had to host. It was like a gala event around Christmas time and everyone was wearing ball gowns except me. I went and got a wrap dress at Target because it was all I could afford. It paid $1,000, which is more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And I was so nervous because my dad got me the gig. So it was all people my dad worked with. He was really nervous. All I had were rape and abortion jokes because I was trying to be Sarah Silverman at the time. I was like a year into comedy. I had one TV credit. So I was like a big enough deal to get the gig, I guess. They had no idea what they were in for. I got wasted beforehand because I was so nervous. I blacked out during my set. I don't even remember what I did, but I definitely did the worst jokes ever to a, a bunch of people at a Christmas function where they were all literally dressed like the Met Gala, like in ball gowns. And I remember no one liked me. I had flop sweat immediately. I had to keep going up after I had already bombed to like bring up presenters one after the other. And then after the gig, I remember waiting for my car at valet, which my friend drove because I was wasted, but I was waiting for my car and this woman came up and she just went right up to my face and 
it was before Donald Trump was president, but I just remember her reminding me of Donald Trump, the way he used to fire people. He'd go like, you fired and do that like little like snake move in their face, like with his hand. And she just goes, you were awful. You were awful in front of all these people when I was waiting for my car. And she was like, you were so inappropriate for this event. And the woman that was my friend, who was like my dad's friend who booked me, was like, you shut up, you dumb bitch, and like got in her face. And so these two women were fighting in ball gowns about whether or not I was funny, which I was funny. The woman was right. I was completely, completely inappropriate for that event. And so that's why I won't do corporate gigs anymore unless they pay me like $1,001. At Nikki Glazer is the way to reach her on Twitter. And the woman that was screaming at her uh, was Mrs. Colin Quinn. It's all starting to come together now. Uh, this is Hell Gigs. Next up is Akash Singh. Uh, and um, you can check him out on the Flagrant 2 podcast that's available on iTunes. Let's find out about his Hell Gig. So first of all, I had a horrible time getting to the gig. I missed my train. I lost money. By the time I got there, I had to buy a new ticket. Second of all, I get to the show. I'm in a bad mood already. The show is just not a great setup for comedy. Like, the room is mad cavernous. Laughs get lost in there. And I go up last. And I just don't feel like giving energy because I had a horrible time getting up there. So I'm kind of taking my time. And then off to the side, there's these people uh, with a T-shirt company. And they're just kind of talking amongst themselves. And so I stop, I ask them some questions, I get laughs, everything is friendly. I go back to the audience, they keep talking, they get louder. And then I say, why are you guys making noise as a t-shirt company? Shut up. And then they say something smart back, and I say, you know what's funny? You're a t-shirt company. You're looking at me like I'm not going to make it, and you're a t-shirt company. (laughs) And then things got kind of nasty, and the crowd definitely liked me more. But, oh, God, this is so embarrassing. I can't believe I'm going to say this. When you are bombing or when you're not doing well or when you're battling hecklers, there are most of the time I'm pretty good about keeping my head. But every once in a while you say something that you would just feel like, why would I say that? And at one point they were telling me I wasn't going to make it or I wasn't funny or something. And I can't believe I said this. I said, why don't we just get on? Why don't you just get on stage and we'll compare bank statements right now, which is to this day the douchiest thing I've ever said in my life. I can't believe I said that. But anyway, that's what you know how ugly it's getting. Because on stage, even if I'm a little guy, I have to stay on my ground. It's the only way I can get respect from an audience. And I'll die on that stage. I really will. As soon as I get off, I remember I'm little. On that stage, I'm not backing down. Exactly what happens. I keep going harder and harder. I don't say anything that awful again in terms of douchiness, but I'm just saying meaner stuff, whatever. Get off stage. These guys are heated. I see their three little t-shirts. I go over there and try to talk to them. I'd be like, listen, guys, I I tried to say, I know I was mean, but you understand why I had to do that. They weren't trying to have it. We get separated. Another guy comes and talks to me, saying a different guy wearing the same T-shirt. Suddenly, there's like 14 or 15 guys wearing this T-shirt from this T-shirt company. And I'm very confused. And then I realize that these are the people throwing the event. So I'm really freaking out now. And at this point, (laughs) these guys are circling me like sharks. And the bouncers at the venue have to stand in front of me to protect me. I'm just in the middle of a room, bouncer standing in front of me, and they're telling the guys from the t-shirt company, you can't hurt him here. And then I look closer at the guys from the t-shirt company. These aren't businessmen. These are giant dudes who are ready to fight. So I'm trying to get out of there, trying to get paid. The guy who's doing the show, like, no, 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 we need to get paid before you can leave. I'm like, forget the money. That's how I felt. So I'm freaking out. This guy's taking forever to get money. And when he finally gets money, I put my backpack on, and then all of a sudden, every person from the t-shirt company, 15, 16 guys, say they have to smoke a cigarette and they all go outside. They are waiting outside to beat the shit out of me. So I have to get snuck out of the side door and lower my head so no one can see me as we drive past the venue. That is my hell gig. My life was truly in danger, and I don't think it gets worse than that. Wow. That one turned into uh, a dateline by the time we were done. I didn't know whether he was going to make it or not. Uh, Joe List is next up on our Hell Gig show. Uh, you know his podcast, Tuesdays with Stories, and that's uh, available now on iTunes. And you can go to ComedianJoeList.com for all of Joe's dates. Um, but let's find out his Hell Gig. 
my hell gig is in 2001 or maybe 2000, I was a teenager. My friend was doing comedy at a Gold's Gym, and I was so desperate for stage time. I said he was getting paid, I think, 50 bucks, and I was like, give me 10 bucks, and I'll do time in front of you at the gym. And so we did comedy at a Gold's Gym, and there was a guy doing, he looked just like Bruce Springsteen. He was doing a leg press behind me, and he kept dropping the weight, about 900 pounds or so, big thighs. And it just kept clanging behind me. And there was three women on ellipticals. Two of them had headphones on and one of them looked angry. And that was my hell gig. Joe List uh, talking about his hell gig. But he did make sure that he negotiated a sweet 10 bucks for himself. At Joe List. At Joe List. Go ahead and uh, tweet him. Next up is, I think, one of the hottest comics working in the city right now uh, i'll just tell you this i've seen him so many times at the comedy cellar and i don't want to jinx anybody but he kills every single time he's just a killer he does the four corners podcast uh and that's available on Riotcast and itunes and he's going to be performing november 13th at the fat black pussycat in New York, go to ComedyCellar.com for tickets. It's Lenny Marcus. My hell gig is 1997, I want to say. Catch a rising star, Princeton. I think I almost started a full-out brawl. Saturday, I'm the MC. There's a bachelor party. It's got to be like 30 guys in the front of this small place, and it's the middle show. This is the key show. I go up, and this bachelor party will not let me talk at all you know they, they're they're all over me yelling stuff out and so i kind of handle them hey it's the gay bowling team you know whatever i could do a bunch of stock lines and then i go into my act a little bit and they will have none of it and talking about my mother and they're killing me i get off i only have to do 10 minutes 15 minutes i bring up tom ryan and his next half hour it was one of the worst things i've ever seen people be to a comedian like these guys just every word out of his mouth it's the most all the rest of the people there's another hundred people there that want to see a show and these guys will not cut it out and i'm like i start going back to the owner i have no business i've been in comedy two years you know i go back to the owner and i or whoever the manager and i say you gotta get these guys out you gotta throw these guys out don't make me go back if i go back up there it's not gonna be pretty so i go back up and i lace into these guys i absolutely just ream these guys, and it's it's getting madder and madder. And I start picking on this small. This one guy gets up. He goes, "You suck." I'm like, "You're a midget." I mean, I'm killing this guy. I mean, I'm making fun of this guy's dick. Probably, I'm killing the bachelor. Who's getting married? I bet you your wife's a pig. You know, like just murdering these guys to the point where this is like a powder cave of craziness. And as people, it's just me yelling insults back and forth. These guys, the cops show up. It's like the state police show up, walk through the crowd in the back, and I back into like two jokes about like. The South, you guys are like a crowd in the South, and, and just they kill. And then I had this like country song that I did. It was like country song parody. It murders, right? I go and how about a hand for the New York, New Jersey State Police? And the place goes crazy, and they escort thirty guys at least out of the crowd, and one at a time. They just escort these guys out, and as they're escort, it's chaos, and they're threatening to kill me on the way out. All of them are stopping to yell, "You're an asshole." I'm coming back to get you. You know, you'll see us. I'll be back in a half an hour. And I'm like, bye. I'm like waving goodbye like an idiot. You know, bye. Finally, the last guy on the way out says, stops. And the cops are like pulling him away. It was out of a movie. And he he looks at me and and the crowd hushes down. He goes, I want to say something. I want to say something. And this guy's like, I don't know, he's got to be 70 years old. He's like, I'm the father of the groom. He goes, we didn't start this riot. You started this riot. And I go, shut the hell up, old man. And the rest of the 100 people go, ah, you know, and they drag him out of the thing. And so now me and Tom Ryan, the next, we have to go back. It's only, (laughs) we have to go back for the Sunday show. And the next day, for the next 24 hours, we are ducking what we think is going to be bullets. Everywhere we go, is that a guy from yesterday? Is that a guy? Because we can't leave this town. You know, we're in the town for another day. Lenny Marcus, uh, first time doing the Hell Gig show that the police had to show up for it. Um, I think his big laugh was shut up, old man. <laughs> I love that Tom Ryan is drug into this as well. Uh, next up is a guy who, well, quite frankly, he's 
TV show, his popular TV show, was a hell gig for most of us that were watching. Um, one of the funniest and most original guys out there. And let's face it, if he hadn't gotten a nut cancer, we probably never would have heard of Jackass, the TV show. Uh, Tom Green, go to TomGreen.com. Let's find out about his hell gig. My hell gig, uh, doing stand up. You know, you go to a lot of interesting places. I don't want to say the exact city because I, you know, I don't want to like, you know, get everybody all mad or whatever. But it was probably in a small town, northern Canadian mining community. I ended up up there, and everybody in the audience was so drunk that I don't even know that they could hear what I was saying. And all they were doing was yelling the entire time. And uh, it felt it felt kind of like I wasn't going to get out of there alive, to be honest with you. But uh, I ended up, you know, you, you just, if you can't beat them, you join them. And I just got drunk with them, and it was pretty good. Tom Green, uh, part of our Hell Gigs. Now, this next guest uh, surprises me that she's even doing Hell Gigs because uh, she's not a stand-up, but she comes from the world of improv. She's a big, big TV star. Uh, she's got a book out now called My Squirrel Days that's available in stores and online. Uh, this is Ellie Kemper. My hell gig was one particularly awful performance of my one-person show, Feeling Sad Slash Mad with Ellie Kemper, where I was performing at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in Chelsea in New York, and there were people in the audience, but nobody... So it wasn't that it was an empty house. It was that nobody laughed except one person once, and I was so demoralized after that because you're, like, up there, you know, metaphorically tap dancing, like, trying to make these people laugh, and nobody laughed, and I thought I had no business performing. I had wasted these people's time, and most of all, I was just humiliated. So I, I got on the subway feeling like... I should quit acting. And I, by the time I got home, I thought, no, I should, I should keep doing this. So I think that was just a matter of giving myself a pep talk. But in the moment, I, you want to throw yourself out the window because you're demoralized. Ellie Kemper just picked herself up, dusted herself off, and got right back into the game. And now Netflix is glad that she did. The, the guy who does the best Donald Trump in the country uh, has a book now called American Tantrum, the Donald J. Trump Presidential Archives. It's available in stores and online. This is Anthony Atamanik. My worst hell gig is uh, I went and performed for a bunch of cores, like the company, the marketing company that does like cores and Corona or whatever. And it was all these marketing people in the room. And I watched their video presentation. It was so manipulative. This was self-imposed. It was so manipulative and grotesque. And I couldn't believe I was doing this work for this stupid corporate event that when we went up to do our improv set, I went up and just insulted the president of the company for five minutes. And then he stood up and yelled at me to get off the stage. And then they kicked me out and I wasn't paid. Uh, and that's my worst hell gig. <laughs> Anthony Tamanek, uh pick up his book, American Tantrum, the Donald J. Trump Presidential Archives. Uh, that's available now and in stores and online. Uh, this is Hell Gigs. Comedians talking about the worst night of their careers. And some of them, of just hundreds and hundreds of this. It, it'd be surprising how long it takes to get established as a stand-up comedian. And this gentleman comes from Scotland. And I'm always amazed when people can come from other countries and when they get here, they don't know all the references and and they don't share the same cultural background with us, but they dive in and do their stand-up. This is Daniel Sloss. My hell gig was when I was about 17 years old. I was asked to do a TV warm up for some not fucking comedy show in uh, Glasgow. It's about two in the afternoon. I had about 10 minutes of material, and nine minutes of that was masturbation jokes. And uh, the audience were, I think the average age of them was fucking dead. And um, I go out, and it's like a 30 minute spot, and 
I do all my jokes and they hate them, rightfully so, and I try and make fun of the producer and or the presenter and they're like, don't do that. And then I try and make fun of the cont- contestants and like, don't do that. And so I'm just sitting there with no fucking material. And I'm just bombing and eating shit in front of these people that are going to be dead in 10 years. And I'd be lying if I was to say this gig was 11 years ago and I'm thrilled that every one of those cunts is dead. It wasn't even booing, it was just disdain. There was a woman in the front row who was in a wheelchair and she picked up her walking stick and just tried to hit me off the stage until I stopped. Uh, and she had a point, I was shit. It was absolutely my fault. But um, I win because I'm breathing. Uh, that's hilarious. You know what? You can get laid so much just with that accent in New York City. Uh, Daniel Sloss, it's Daniel underscore Sloss uh, on Twitter. And this is all part of Hell Gigs. Now, up next, it's the Bay Ridge Boys. Uh, that podcast is available on uh, YouTube. And uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm Because um, they do the Bay Ridge Boys and they also do uh, History Hyenas together on iTunes and, and uh, Riotcast. So I'm just going to flip a coin and whatever, you know, it comes up, I'll announce that Bay Ridge Boy first because it's Chris... The Stefano and Giannis Papas. So that was a big coin. Chris the Stefano. My hell gig was the time I opened up for uh, Richard Lewis at some Italian restaurant in Queens called Scungili's. And uh, I didn't know it was like a mafia gig. And um, some I offended some guy's wife because I was doing comedy for two years. And I probably just made a bad joke, which I still do 10 years into comedy. But I offended him and the guy grabbed me by the shoulder after the show and put a knife to my throat and said, how about I cut your Adam's apple out and feed it to your mother? And I remember the owner of the establishment being like, you know, he was another mafia guy and him being like, he told Sal, the guy, the guy who was holding the knife to my throat, his name was Sal, I guess. He was like, Sal, put the fucking knife down. You're going to get us pinched over here. Put the knife down. And then the owner of the bar took me out of the restaurant and when he was taking me out, he took me out through a back door. I, I truly believed I was going to be murdered. And then he said, never say another word about this gig again, which, sorry. And he, and he gave me $5,000 in cash just to shut my mouth. What, and obviously the restaurant is not the name and Sal's not the name, but I did, that did happen. And hopefully that mafia guy never hears it. He's probably dead or in jail. That is the most Brooklyn story I have heard in a long time. At the end of it, here's 5,000. Now, what legitimate business? Think of a legitimate business. You could go into most pla- You could go in to a Sears, fall down the escalator and lose your pinky, and no one's going to hand you five grand. <laughs> at Chris D. Comedy. At Chris D. Comedy. He's hilarious. He's also afraid of ghosts. His partner from the Bay Ridge Boys and History Hyenas is next. It's Giannis Papas. My hell gig is the last road gig I did um, where you could really feel how few people were in the audience. And um, that's, uh, it's one big, it, I tell you, it's becoming one big smear. If you don't sell tickets, it's all one long hell gig. This career is one long hell gig. So my hell gig is the last six years on the road where you just look out at the audience and you just, you can actually make out the tapestry of the chairs. You can, yeah, you're like, these are good leather chairs in this club. Um, Anthony DeVito is up next on Hell Gigs. His podcast, The Rad Dude Cast, is available now on iTunes. Anthony DeVito, what is your Hell Gig? My Hell Gig was a, a public pool in Long Island where it was just outdoors. And this isn't even that long ago. This is like a year ago or something like that, where I think I had just done television and one of my next gigs was a public pool in Long Island. It was just all old people. And then um, I think I might have got heckled by one of the lifeguards, which I was also like, man, it's like your job to save people. And <laughs> and you just, oh, my God. Yeah, it was horrible. That was Anthony DeVito talking about his hell gigs. I don't know what it is. And maybe it's some kind of a evil streak. But I like nothing better than these stories. 
And even when De Stefano was saying, I was thought for sure I was going to be killed, I found myself just hyena laughing. Um, next up is uh, a guy who's got a documentary out called The Problem with a with a poo streaming now on true tv.com he's one of our favorites uh he's got a uh, also got a special called warn your relatives that's available on netflix go it's hurry Kanabalo. i was doing a show for the network of indian professionals so already you know i did this for money this was purely a money gig it was at a hotel uh, sometime in midtown Manhattan, right? So I get there, and there's a really big stage, but the audience is very far from the stage. So I'm like, this is not a good setup. And I'm on stage. It was a panel. It was me, uh, Preet Bharara, the former uh, you know, attorney general from New York, you know, of the Southern District, and uh, former Miss America, Nina Davaluri, right? And so I go down to do the gig. The gig was on a dance floor that separated the stage and the audience. So I'm performing on a dance floor, which already is like, this is not going to go well. But I'm like, you know what? If the sh-, you know, and also there was an echo from the microphone. That's not good. High ceilings. But I think to myself, you know what? I'm going to make this work. So I go on the dance floor. Within about 30 seconds, I knew this wasn't going to go well. And I knew that because they were all still talking. And so I do about, I think they wanted me to do 20 minutes. I did my 20 minutes. Very little laughter. A lot of improvisation. It was just, it wasn't booze. It was just staring at you. Like you're an animal in a cage. It's like, why does this person have the need to do this? Like while, like I'm questioning myself, like why am I doing this? Why am I talking into a microphone in front of people but not saying anything of value to them? Like the whole thing was horrific. And then people started walking out. And I'm like, oh, was it that bad? And I found out it was worse than that. It's not that they didn't like what I was saying. They wanted to leave because they wanted to get food and there was a buffet. So the buffet beat me out and I was still going. Then people started eating. When people eat, are eating in front of you and you just hear the clinking of the glasses. And so that ended and it was terrible. And there was some pity clapping. And I had to walk back through the dance floor onto the elevated stage with Preet Bharara and former Miss America Nina Davaluri. Preet Bharara didn't even bother with saying good set. He didn't want to lie, which is admirable, you know, assistant, uh, you know, being a district attorney and all. And Nina Davaluri said that was really good, which was polite of her. And I'm like, I hate the fact that, you know, you saw me for the first time. That was it. He's like, no, I saw you once before. I'm like, where'd you see me? Oh, at the show you did at the University of Michigan when I was a student there. And I remember that gig. It was... Uh, a gig that was at a country club, also on a dance floor. It's the only other time I performed on a dance floor in front of a bunch of kids who somehow decided before their dance they wanted me to do stand-up. Bunch of kids in gowns and nice suits, excited to go on a date, and I'm yelling at them about racism and sexism and all the things I talk about, and they just want to have a good time. And I'm not, you know, as some people might know, I'm not really a good time comic. I'm more of a a Wednesday or a Thursday comic as opposed to a late Friday, late Saturday. So Miss America, Nina Davaluri, has has seen me twice do comedy, both on dance floors, both to majority South Asian audiences, both two of the worst gigs I've ever had in my life. So we know Miss America does not think I'm funny. My favorite line there is, I'm not a good time comic. Oh, that is so funny. David Cross is up next. Uh, he's currently on his Oh, Come On Tour. Go to officialdavidcross.com for tickets. You can also tweet him at, at David Cross. Let's find out what David Cross's hell gig is. One of the worst was opening up for the Strokes and Guided by Voices at the Apollo Theater on New Year's Eve. And uh, nobody knew I was going to be uh, 45 minutes of hilarious stand-up comedy before the music started, and it did not go well at all. It was, uh, in fact, I've, I've never done this before, but I, I said, look, I'm contractually obligated to be up here. And people are, oh, and they gave out noisemakers. So they gave out noisemakers. So it's an entire theater full of 
fucked up people with noisemakers, and I'm trying to tell jokes about my sister in Georgia. And I eventually just said, you know, I said, I have to be up here, and people are screaming and yelling, booing, get, get me off. And I'm like, I can't, I'm not leaving, but I have to do this. And then eventually I just turned my back to him and sort of wrapped myself in the curtain and then just did the set from there. <laughs> and I was like, you guys can go drink or whatever. I have to do this. So it was awful. It was not good. I cannot imagine how much money David Cross was getting <laughs> paid to do that bad gig. Um, and handing out, first of all, it's never easy uh, opening for a rock band. Um, and it's never easy working New Year's Eve. But to put both of that together, no, not worth it at all. Um, Colin Quinn performs at the Fat Black Pussycat every Tuesday night in New York City at 7 p.m. You can go to the ComedyCellar.com for tickets for all Colin's dates. Go to ColinQuinn.com, his Twitter. I am Colin Quinn, and it's one of the funniest Twitters in the history of the Internet. Very quickly, Colin, what's your hell gig? My hell gig, I mean, there's not one, there's a lot. But one of the worst is I was famous for was when I got chased out of North Tonawanda with baseball bats back in the 80s. Because the, I was bombing, and then the crowd turned on me, and then I started trying to give them the finger. And that was a mistake. Baseball bats. Not a good night. Jim Florentine at jimflorentine.com. And he's got a uh, a podcast called Comedy Metal. And then it's M-Words. The M-Words for short people. We don't use that uh, today. We're woke. It's available on iTunes and at riotcast.com. On Twitter, go to him uh, at Mr. Jim Florentine, uh, one of my favorite comedians and favorite storytellers. Um, but like everybody else, he's had a hell gig. My worst hell gig was actually on TV. I'm doing comedy about two years. I get picked to go down to spring break in Daytona Beach to be on MTV with Paulie Shore when he did his Paulie Shore show. The bit was Paulie was going to be on stage and I was going to heckle him from the front row on the beach with his crowd. He was going to say, if you think you're so funny, you come up here and tell some jokes. I go on stage. I tell my jokes like three minutes. I kill. The crowd's going crazy. And then Paulie gets mad and he throws me off the stage. So I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. We get down there right before we're ready to film the bit. The director goes, look, we're not going to tell Paulie's audience you're a comedian. And even Paulie goes, no, you need to tell them. They're going to hate him. He goes, no, it'll work out fine. So they don't tell Paulie's crowd that I'm a real comic. So I do the whole thing. I get up there. Before I get my first joke out, I am getting booed. They are booing me. They're singing, na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. When it was over, Paulie's like, you can't air that. They go, don't worry, we'll sweeten it up. We'll take out the, the booze in post. It'll look fine. When it aired a week later, I think they added more booze. It, they must have showed that 50 times, and it made the best of MTV Spring Break. That's how many times they showed them. The worst gig I ever had was on TV and shown at least 75 times. <laughs> that is a great one, man. That is fantastic. Uh, at Mr. Jim Florentine. And can you believe that we've come to the last hell gig? And uh, Vito Calise, the executive producer of this show, has said to me, I'm saving the best for last. And that's Elaine Boozler. We just done an unmasked earlier this uh, year with uh, Elaine Boozler, and she was fantastic. And one of the real uh, pioneers of um, the kind of modern comedy. She was uh, at the improv very early on and has probably done every single gig that you can do. So this is Hell Gigs and uh, Elaine Boozler. 
My Hell gig took place in Atlantic City, oh God, in the 80s. And um, they used to have a review show where they'd have all these kind of scantily clad dancers changing costumes a mile a minute. And then there'd be a 25-minute spot for the comedian to come out and perform right before the big finishing number. So one night, it was pretty crowded. And right before I was to come out, a guy died in the audience. I mean, it's not funny, but he did. He just dropped dead. And it was horrible. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in something like that, but people start to throw up. And it's just, it's very traumatic. And they're, you know, banging on him and trying to bring him back. And he's not coming back. And, you know, he's dead. And of course, the dancers are all changed for the big final number. And, you know, I'm supposed to do my 25 minutes. But obviously, you know, the normal thing would be just to bring out the final number and let everybody go or just let everybody go. Well, I'm expecting the dancers to go on and do the big clothes, and the booker comes up and he goes, get out there. And I said, what? He said, get out there. Get out there and do your comedy. And I said, or, you know, we could. He said, get out there. I said, or, (laughs) and he was having none of it. On the way out, I had to really think about it, and I thought, well, there's two ways to go. I'm a very, very straightforward, honest comic. I, I always say what's right in front of me. I would have to talk about what just happened. Or I could just come out and say, how many people hated high school? Well, I chose how many people hated high school. And every hand in the house went up. They were so happy to be transported out of that hell room that it all kind of worked out for most of us that night. Ugh, yeah, everybody but one. At Elaine Boozler. At Elaine Boozler. And by the way, Timeless is a collection of four of Elaine's specials that's available now on Amazon.com. And that is it. 28 different comedians tell their hell gigs. And I have to say, every year we always say, oh, we want to make this show better every single year. Uh, But I do have to say last year was better. Did not go the way we wanted it to. Uh, Quite frankly, some of these I don't even think were hell gigs. Uh, some of them were just um, slightly off nights. But if you get the opportunity, last year's phenomenal, folks. Really, really good stuff. We'll see you back here next year if you have us for hell gigs.